I call to order the work session of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for September 26, 2017. Before commencing, I'd like to recognize two Boy Scouts in the uh, audience with us tonight, Joshua Quinn from Newtown High School and Levan Sands from Deer Park Middle School. So welcome, both of you. Um, I now invite all of you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Jane Lucas, a kindergartner at West, Town, uh, West House and Elementary School, and uh, then ask you to remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Yeah. Ms. Lucas. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And thank you, Jane Lucas. Okay. Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right, we'll proceed with the agenda as prepared. Uh, item D on our agenda is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in a box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from Ms. Schaefer and delivered to Mr. Virch will be our speakers for the evening. <laughs> Ray Tinsley. Kim Brown. Muriel Tinder. Eileen Canfield. Maria Royals. Jim Mellig. Cynthia Boyd. Hillary Martell. Sharon Saroff. Howard Libet. I think that's 10. Thank both of you. Uh, it is time for public comment now. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. Uh, we refer concerns to the superintendent. While encouraging public input on policy programs and practices within uh, the scope of this board, um, it is not proper at this forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education. Um, I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell uh, and see the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time. I now call on our advisory uh, groups to speak. Um, and the first to speak is TABCO's representative, Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. Good evening, Good evening. Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, and members of the board. The month of September has flown by and our schools are humming along. There are great things happening throughout the county. The teachers are giving their usual 110% for their kids. I hear it wherever I go. That in turn means the students are being encouraged, cajoled, pushed, and pulled to do their best work as well. To that end, 
While this year we have seen less changes than we have in the past, there are still curricular changes and technology changes occurring throughout the system. Teachers are still struggling to work efficiently with the technology issues they are facing. Just planning a single lesson could take a few hours of searching and clicking many times to access what is needed. Multiply that times five or six lessons in any given day depending on what level you teach and it doesn't leave enough time in a 24 hour day to plan and teach, let alone eat and say hello to your family. It doesn't even leave time to sleep or take care of the necessities in life and I don't have to tell you what that is. This kind of workload cannot be maintained. It is no wonder we teachers are telling our children, our own children, not to go into the profession. On another note, this board is, ask, is asking for public comment on the discipline policy at the next school board meeting. I have informed the board about TABCO's discipline committee. We met with BCPS officials with our ideas and are forming a joint committee to work towards implementation of ideas surrounding in our schools. This work will address school discipline plans, follow through, and proper implementation of restorative justice practices, to name a few of the items. I would like to remind the board that the board policy is to be broad and overarching. The rules and manuals should house the specific discipline procedures. This makes sense in that those rules need to be flexible in a way that BCPS policies should not. The workload and discipline issues I addressed in, in the previous two paragraphs are the top issues for our teachers. We conducted a survey of our teachers and received over 1,700 responses. Here are just a few. I have been doing 12 to 13 hour days to try and keep up with my workload. This is the way over the time that I get paid and I'm still not done. Everything is a priority, but I'm really already feeling burnt out after seven works, work days. I work almost all weekend trying to prepare documents and paperwork as well as class lessons, etc. Planning is very time consuming due to difficulty quickly accessing online curriculum. There are too many clicks of the keyboard that require a lot of waiting for links and resources to load. Then it times out and you have to start over. Many times teachers are required to attend their school evening activities that interfere with personal and family obligations. There is no additional pay for back to school or other evenings that require teachers to work 10 to 12 hour days. Thank you, Ms. Baden. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Megan Stewart Sicking. Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, members of the board, good evening to all of you. As CCAC looks forward to our first meeting of the year next week, there are several items to note. First, the Office of Special Ed is working on their next budget right now, so I will be back with more specifics at the next several board meetings. Next, we are following with interest the Office of Special Ed required monthly trainings. For part of the time, the focus is on compliance training with the Offices of Special Ed and Law working together. For other portions, the Offices of Special Ed and ELA are providing professional learning to IEP chairs, special educators, reading specialists, and department chairs as a team from each school. We are thrilled to know they are learning how the brain regions are involved in reading, how neurological differences can lead to reading difficulties, and how to support struggling readers and those with dyslexia. And finally, a word about transportation. Every parent worries about their children. Special needs parents worry a lot more, and rightfully, as our children may not even be able to speak for themselves. I have heard of normal parents being so worried about putting their child on the bus for the first time that they follow their child's bus to school. I know people who have done it. Imagine how much more intense that feeling must be for the special needs parent. When things go wrong, it's bad for anyone. When things go wrong for special needs students, it's terrifying for parents. There are issues that need to be addressed, and I know both you and transportation are well aware of this. What concerns me also is that with the valid issues being reported and even covered on the news, 
There is also work being done by the offices of transportation and special ed, and there's no real public forum to share that information. If we only hear one side of the story and have no idea what the response is, we only hear the negative and end up with a serious public image problem. I know that the Office of Special Ed and the Office of Transportation have developed a multi-year strategic plan to address system systemic areas of need. Among other things, actions are being taken to develop disability awareness for bus drivers and also monitoring routes for special ed transportation buses. I want to thank the Office of Special Ed for reaching out to us to invite representatives from transportation to our next executive board meeting. Our leadership will be meeting with Mr. McRae, director, and Mr. West, the assistant director, in October. We will learn more about the collaborative action plan between the offices of special ed and transportation, and I look forward to learning more about how we can work together to avoid problems in the future. Good timing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, and that is Jane Lee and or Leslie Weber. Leslie Weber. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Board of Education members, and Ms. White. I'm Leslie Weber, Communications Chair of the PTA Council of Baltimore County, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Jane Lee. Unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts, we've had to postpone our fall reception workshops and general meeting planned for this coming. As soon as a new date and location are announced, we'll send out invitations and post the information on our website. We'd like to take this opportunity to affirm our support for a public hearing on school behavior and to restate our hope that BCPS continues working to find for ongoing transportation issues. PGA Council leadership hopes to have hold regular meetings with Ms. White to address these and other pressing issues. PTA Council attended the sep September 14th curriculum and instruction meeting at which BCPS responded to the Johns Hopkins year three year end evaluation of STAT. After studying the facts and figures presented in the Hopkins report, those presented by Hopkins at the August 8th Board of Education meeting and those offered at the September curriculum and instruction meeting, we must raise some concerns and point out some inconsistencies. As we've expressed before, we're worried about alarming rates of off-task behavior and the fact that there's no solution available to teachers to keep track of what students are doing on their devices. Having said that, teachers need to focus on teaching, not on being full-time screen monitors. The JHU report examined MAP scores in Lighthouse and non-Lighthouse grades one to three, but saw only some impact on student achievement. Principals and STAT teachers were hesitant to comment on the direct impact of STAT on gains. At the curriculum and instruction meeting, BCPS stated that the statistical significance of slight achievement gains was not measured. Also at the curriculum instruction meeting, it was suggested that P21 skills were improving, but the Hopkins report stated otherwise. Principals noted that it was challenging to ascertain whether P21 skills had increased as a result of STAT. Hopkins had anticipated that cohort one classrooms, students in lighthouse schools in their third year with devices, would display P21 skills more frequently, but that was not the case. When asked at the curriculum instruction meeting how to describe the differences from before STAT was initiated to now, BCPS characterized progress as neither monumental nor minimal, but stated that the system was moving in the expected direction at the expected pace. In the new business portion of this meeting, you'll hear more about MAP and about PARC scores. For the time and money being invested in this initiative, we should be hearing that great strides are being made. The FY18 Approved operating budget reported that only 50% of BCPS third graders are on grade level for reading. So it's clear that minimal gains in MAP scores are not closing major achievement gaps. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, and that's Lila Marinbloom. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent uh, White, and the Baltimore County Board of Education. I am Lila Marinbloom, President of the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. 
I'm here to talk to you about Kronos. Before Kronos, we were expected to be in the building 15 minutes before school officially opened and remain in the building until 15 minutes after the last student left. Classroom paras were available to help maintain order in the hallways and classrooms. We were also available to meet with teachers to confer about upcoming lesson plans. Since the introduction of Kronos, our members are given only three and a half minutes before the bell and three and a half minutes after the bell to swipe in. Find some place to put one's coat and bag and put our lunch away and get to our workstation. The fact that we have gone from helping students to prepare for the day to competing with them in preparing for the day has resulted in an increased opportunistic chaos by unsupervised students as well as undue stress on staff and students. To further add to the confusion, no one using Kronos received any training in how to use or more importantly, monitor or make small adjustments if needed. There are occasions when students and staff emergencies in hallways or in the office prevent Paris from getting to the time clock in the allotted seven minute period. There have even been times when the clock was offline and it showed a swipe but did not register it. The remedy for all these problems is that every minute after the allotted time a para misses becomes a 15 minute payroll deduction. Another example of how Kronos affects our day is our mandatory 30 minute lunch period. We are now expected to travel to the office, swipe out for lunch, travel to wherever we are going to eat, return to the office to swipe back in and report to our next period on time. In some larger schools, going back and forth just to swipe out and in can consume 15 to 20 minutes of the allotted 30 minute lunch period. ESPIC is requesting a bipartisan group, including those who must use Kronos, to further study how to effectively use it in the, in the building. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education. That's Julie miller Bretz. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. At the last Board of Education meeting, I shared with you all a big concern regarding the size of the staff that serves the gifted and talented students here in Baltimore County. The Advanced Academic Office currently has one coordinator, one secretary, and four resource teachers, whereas a decade ago it had a coordinator, nine resource teachers, two primary talent development teachers, and one catalyst teacher in each Title I school. Of course, we understand that times do change and that budget realities have not been easy on schools over the last decade. So we wondered what some of the other surrounding school districts have done with their GT budgets and how their staffing compares to BCPS. As it turns out, when we did look at staffing resources devoted to students receiving advanced academic services across counties, we found that BCPS is rather stunningly behind their peers. Baltimore County has a student population of 112,139 and a teacher population of 9,076. It has a staff of five in the Advanced Academic Office, meaning a ratio of 22,428 students to one for students to AA staff and of 1,815 to one for teachers to AA staff. By the way, we have no reliable numbers on how many AA students are in each school district, so we are using total stu student numbers, but are assuming that each district has the same average ratio of GT students to total school population. Montgomery County has 159,010 students and 13,094 teachers and a staff of 26 serving the AA population for a ratio of 6,116 to one um, students to AA staff and 504 to one for teachers to AA staff. And Arundel County has 81,000 students, 6,660 6, 6, teachers and 22 dedicated AA staff, resulting in a 3,682 to one student to staff ratio and a 300 to one teacher to staff ratio. 
Frederick County has 41,378 students, 2,940 teachers, and 30 staff serving AA students. Their ratios end up at 1,379 to 1 for students and 98 to 1 for teachers. Howard County represents the high water mark. They have 55,638 students, 13,094 teachers, and a total of 112 advanced academic staff. That calculates to a ratio of 400 497 to 1 per students to AA staff and a 38 to 1 ratio for teacher to AA staff. Clearly, a school system that provides staffing at Howard County's level can provide many more services than one that provides staffing at Baltimore County's level. With the implementation of Maryland's new ESSA plan, in which gifted and talented students will be included as a student group in the accountability system, and in the spirit of providing equitable services to this student population, the Advanced Academic Office must be funded at appropriate levels. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is a representative from CASE, and that's Tom DeHart. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Good evening, Chairman Gillis, S Superintendent White, and members of the board. I want to share some positive thoughts with you tonight. You may recall that in my prior messages to the board, I've emphasized the need for consistency through all facets of the organization, and also the need for ongoing professional development and support for school-based leadership. Tomorrow, all BCPS principals will convene for a monthly principal leadership meeting where valuable information and professional development will occur. In years past, principals would have been expected to carry that information and learning back to their schools and share it appropriately with their assistant principals. That lended itself to many different messages with varying levels of success. On Thursday and Friday of this week, however, all assistant principals will be attending one of four sessions with the same truncated content shared with principals tomorrow. The same process will be repeated throughout the year. This model of support and professional development provides consistency of message to the frontline leadership in the schoolhouse. Kudos to Superintendent White for this visionary paradigm shift and to Billy Burke and Heather Logman and her team for the implementation of this vision. <coughs> Finally, I would like to congratulate two case members, Fran Glick, the coordinator for Library Media Programs and Digital Resources, has been named one of six national finalists for the School Superintendent Association's Women in Leadership Awards. And also to case member Sandra Reed, principal at Pikesville High School, for being named Maryland's Secondary Principal of the Year. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is from uh, ask me, and that's uh, Michael Fahey. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, uh, uh, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Uh, I just have a couple of um, issues about the um, the routing sheets for the for transportation that are generated by this new routing system. Um, routing sheets, the, the writing is so small that it's hard to read. Um, these are the new sheets this year. Um, you've got to remember that we're trying to read this while we're driving the bus. We've got to hold it in one hand while we're driving the bus. And there's discipline issues, there's other issues on, on traffic, and it's, it's just not working. Uh, it's not safe. Um, there was no consultation with the bus drivers before this was implemented, before the changes to the new routing sheets were, 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 were put in. Um, we were told that um, the um, Office of Staff Relations uh, refused our offer to uh, negotiate this issue. Uh, buses are being routed into roads that are previously deemed unsafe for buses where they can't turn around. Uh, the star system, which is supposed to keep track of students, is a complete disaster because a lot of students are not even put on the list. So you might have pre-K or kindergarten, uh, like I have, on the, on the bus. 
you don't have their names, you don't have the stop that they're supposed to be dropped off at. We have the liability, but not the responsibility. Um, <coughs> This is uh, putting school children at risk of death or injury, and I'm asking the board to take immediate action and uh, stop our members from having to work in unsafe conditions. I'm also asking for an outside, independent, thorough audit of the Office of Transportation because there are many other issues that are involved. Uh, years of nepotism, cronyism, and favoritism have resulted in staff in positions where they're not capable of the task. This is ongoing, even when I give a specific example, it's ignored. Um, the rest of us are paying the price. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you. Our next speaker is from the Area Education Advisory Council from the Northeast, and that's Lily Lee. BOE members, good afternoon. My name is Lily Lee, speaking for Northeast Advisory Council. And uh, per suggestions and feedbacks from, my, from our stakeholders of Northeast Area Advisory Council, I am laying out the ideas from the community to help resolve the issues, two issues. One is suggestions to improve transportation. The second one is school overcrowding. So let's talk about transportation, how to improve transportation, the suggestions from the community. Point A, first of all, I have to say that our stakeholders do not have any ill will about any employees of transportation office. They generally consider transportation problem as a system problem, but not a people problem. So basically, they would like to see if the base map transportation office has been using this year was really based on the updated Baltimore County map. Some parents say that uh, bus stops show in the map or routes were in the middle of major roads that never served as bus stops before. Obviously, the map was not correct. Okay, point D, uh, point B. Another suggested improvement involves better system management. Some parents said they saw three different buses come to the same neighborhood to pick up kids. While BCPS had been short of buses, and about drivers, they could use that resource for other areas that need it. So point C, address concerns of special education kids with extremely long bus rides. I have heard numerous complaints from parents about this. Not just from one, not just for one specific bus or bus stops. It is a school-wide or county-wide problem. It is beyond what those special education kids can handle physically and psychologically. Hopefully, transportation office can do some adjustment and make the bus rides for those kids shorter. Last point, point D, pay bus drivers better. Our bus drivers deserve better, and paying our bus drivers better is the only way, or at least one of the best ways, to keep our good bus drivers. From what I was told, parents had all great respect and appreciation for all our bus drivers. They all suggest that BCPS pay more to, should pay more to bus drivers, both for those that are employed by the county or by contract bus companies, because they all together are providing for and protecting our children. Okay, the second, uh, the second topic is school overcrowding. The student enrollment for Northeast area will increase about 2,000 in about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that number tells us we need a new brand high school as soon as possible. And the day from PCPS, the second page. Thank you. Thank you. Now time for public comment speakers. And our first speaker <coughs> is Ray Tinsley. Board. Hello, Superintendent. You know, I drove two hours from Delaware today to have two minutes of time. And it's really to talk about not the in particular details of my son, but what a parent that is divorced from a child and the interaction within the school system and how you get results. I've attempted to contact the superintendent's office, called 17 days ago, and I've not got a return call. 
an email through the website where it says email interim superintendent or email the system. I emailed 14 days ago, I haven't got a reply. So I was wondering if you guys can actually analyze the process, how a parent can communicate with superintendent's office for us, please. That's it, thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kim Brown. Good evening, board members. My name is Kimberly Brown, and I am a parent of a student at George Washington Carver. Her name is Grace Brown. I thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I was um, a little concerned and dismayed when I learned um, at the back to school night that the programs and many of the programs at Carver, as well as other schools um, in the Baltimore County area, that their budgets were going to be cut. Um, my daughter is a junior at Carver. She is a dance prime. Uh, she's been at Carver for um, you know, obviously three years, but she also was at Sudbrook, where she also um, auditioned and um, was accepted into the program. Um, the opportunities that she has been given in these primes, in these magnet schools, have been phenomenal. Um, Grace has um, done everything that she can to compete at the next level. Um, she actually went this summer this, uh, to University of the Arts, which is a highly um, regarded school in Philly, and a lot of the students that um, come from Carver Center are um, regarded there at the University of the Arts. So um, one of the things that I just wanted to uh, close with, it's important for our ch children to be exposed to different experiences and environments if the goal is to make them success successful at the next level in the stages of, the, of their life. While we or parents try to seek activities to do just that, we rely on experts such as the teachers and the parents um, that are here supporting us to implement activities and expose them to things that they wouldn't generally receive. The, be the benefit to this educational development is priceless. When funding is cut and teachers are required to eliminate activities, share textbooks, other various cost-saving techniques, te techniques, it's our children that suffer and our ch children suffer generation after generation. It is my prayer that my daughter and other students at Baltimore County Magnet Schools are given the opportunity to be competitive and compete at the next level where all of their skills and talents are developed and exposed for the goal to attend their choice of uh, college, university, or other development. I'm asking the board to consider the reconsider the budget cuts that have adversely affected Carver Centers as well as other magnet schools in the county and their ability um, to help these students to develop and to go on to their next goals in life. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Muriel Tinder. Hi. Um, Good evening. My name is Joanne Tinkler. I'll be sharing my time. Yes, hi. Um, and um, Do you mind if I start? Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to just uh, have a brief comment and uh, release the rest of my time to my sister. My name is Muriel Tinkler. I purchased a home in, uh, near White Marsh in uh, August of 2014. And uh, I specifically purchased this home. <laughs> I was single at the time, I didn't have any kids. Um, it's about five bedrooms, four bedrooms upstairs and a bonus room in the basement. It has a lot of space for myself, my two sisters, and my two nephews. The only reason why I purchased the home was to be in a good school district. That's it. Um, we haven't had any issues with the school. We love the school. We love the parents. Mm -hmm. We love our neighborhood. Um, but towards the end of last year, I made a, um, a complaint about uh, the school bus driver who was mistreating one of my nephews. And I, um, I contacted the principal and the bus, I, I let them know. And um, shortly after that, I believe my nephew was, uh, my nephews were um, unduly <laughs> punished at school. And then we received a letter shortly after that, retroactively withdrawing them from school. Uh, we've filed all of the appeals. And um, I am just, I'm upset about this because now we have people in our community, and I'm not against it, but who are refugees and who are homeless and they can instantaneously be able to attend school. However, my nephews are still out of school. It's been three weeks since school started. They are not residents. They can't be residents in Baltimore City. They can't be homeschooled because you need to be a resident to be homeschooled. We don't know what to do. We all work full time. We're trying to figure out what we're gonna do. It's just, it, it's frustrating. Yeah. So I'm just saying I believe that my nephews should at least have the same constitutional rights as someone who's homeless or a refugee. They should have the same privileges and immunities 
and the same equal protection as they have. I'm sorry. That's okay. All right, real quick. Um, and um, so my concern is for students in the appeals process. During this time, students are not allowed to attend the zone school. I feel this action is detrimental to the students involved and their parents. The parents are now responsible to acquire correct cur a curriculum, online, and workbooks. Ms. Tinkler. Yeah. Um, I, th I believe that there is an appeal already filed on this, yes. and this board sits in a quasi-judicial uh, capacity in that setting, yeah. and there is an opportunity for that appeal to be heard, and when we hear it here, it somehow taints or has the potential to taint our job as the judges in the quasi-judicial proceeding. My concern is for um, kids who are um, for this long appeals process. This is four weeks. and kids are not in school. Okay. So that's my concern. Okay. I, I feel that the kids should at least be in school or some school structure. Very good. And that's the matter that that's the matter that you filed an appeal the, yeah. about. So oh. that'll be heard in a separate but separate for other forum. Kids who are in the same situation, yeah, well, that's what I wanted to bring up. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Eileen Canfield. Is this, is this right? Yes, it is. I'm a parent. I'm also here from George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology, as you know, one of your <coughs> magnet schools, arts magnet school. And my concern is um, my daughter's in the dance program. She's a senior in the dance program. It's a phenomenal dance program. But this year, there have been budget cuts. It went from two teacher, three teachers down to two. So classes are combined. For instance, my daughter is in uh, Ballet 5. Ballet 4 and 5 are now combined in the same class, which is over capacity. It's a large class size now. And they have two different curriculums, and they're all in the same dance room. It's, it's a crazy, difficult situation, made very difficult for the teachers. There are only two teachers now in the whole dance prime to teach from freshmen to seniors, modern and ballet. Every single class is taught by these two teachers, and every single practice for performances is done by them. Everything needs to be done for a full prime by two <coughs> teachers. It's really not fair to them. It's not fair to the students. I had um, my older daughter, who's a senior in college now, also went to Carver in a different prime. It's a phenomenal school. The, whenever I go to that school, the kids are happy. The kids seem to love it. They're walking through the halls with their artwork, or they're dancing, or they're doing their theater lines. It's a great school, and everybody's very proud of that school, and I'm afraid by the budget cuts to the primes, you're watering it down, and you're not going to continue to maintain the, the sort of stellar reputation that school has as an art school in Baltimore County. It's, it's known throughout the state for its excellence, and I think especially the dance prime. And the, the students win awards, and the teachers have won awards. It's really a phenomenal program, but it's being ruined. This is the first year where I see that it's, it's too much for two teachers to maintain. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that, to bring your attention to that. I understand fiscal reality. I understand there have to be budget cuts. But if you don't protect your primes at the art schools, you will not continue to have primes that are so well regarded. And that's sort of what you're on the borderline of now as far as I see it. The chair of the dance department is here, and she will tell you, she will speak and tell you more of the details in depth, but I just wanted to let you know as a parent how we see it going. And it's probably too late to impact my daughter, who's a senior, but because it's such an important issue, and I did so love the dance program there, as has my daughter, I think it's worth bringing to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Royals. Good evening, Good evening. everyone. Um, so I'm the Dance Prime Chair at Carver Center for Arts and Technology. Um, I've been very fortunate to teach in Baltimore County magnet programs at Sudbrook Magnet Middle for 12 years and at Carver Center for six. My three children attended middle magnet programs and high schools. So I have a firsthand knowledge of the impact that these rigorous programs in specialized areas have on student achievement. 
I have many concerns regarding the future of magnet programs and the viability of dance magnet programs due to the changes being made at the BCPS administrative and magnet office levels. The mandate for a standardized assessment in high school magnet dance for this coming year sends a message of uniformity and sameness to parents and prospective students, a one-size-fits-all formula. The established programs at Carver Center and Patapsco are unique, each with specific goals and curricula which correlate with these goals. The uniqueness of our past assessment procedures allowed us to determine which applicants are best suited for our programs. These programs address the needs of different communities, mirroring the diversity of our county. The programs, uh, I'm sorry. These programs address the needs of these different communities, and the expansion of magnet programs at Milford Mill and Lansdowne deserve your support and an opportunity to find their own identity so that they can address another perspective on the art and a different community of dancers and parents. The qualifications for admissions to these programs should remain unique. I'm also disturbed by the cuts occurring this year and continuing into next year for the established magnet schools who consistently demonstrate excellence in the specialized areas when national awards send their students forward to college on scholarship, closing the achievement gap, and are among the highest achieving academic programs in the county and the state. I see in the fiscal year 18 budget that funding is being allocated for expansion of magnet programs. There will be additional seats to offer to qualified applicants, but at what cost? <coughs> at Carver Center, we're being hit with decreases in funding and staffing. In looking at the new budget, it's apparent that the same will occur at other magnet schools. The effects of these cuts are having an immediate impact on our students. We're forced to cut advanced AP courses and combine classes to overcrowding. Our principal was faced with the difficult choi of choice of which excellent magnet teachers to let go. The result in dance is that we lost a celebrated professor of dance from Goucher College, a magnificent teacher, published scholar, and innovator whose Carver career spanned 23 years. Our juniors and seniors are suffering today from this loss. So I'm asking you to stop the bleeding and restore Carver and other successful programs to full strength. Got it through. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jim Melia. Thank you. Um, good evening, board members and Mrs. White. And thank you for your volunteerism, all the time you spend. Uh, it's a thankless job. and. It may be less thankless after I get <laughs> done, but I'll, I'll be, I'll be kind. Um, so I'm here today as a Baltimore County taxpayer to speak about the proposed renovation at Lansdowne High School. And I think it's a difficult decision to have when you don't have drawings in front of you and you don't have a price tag attached to it. So all of the talk and all of the voting is, is kind of up in the air. But <clears throat> as I watched the last meeting on my computer, um, I saw some of the board members' uh, comments uh, giving unrelented to support to engineers and the documents um, engineers produce. Um, and I'd like to remind uh, some of the board that uh, it was Takata engineers that designed airbags. Uh, they didn't go so well. And Volkswagen engineers that developed the emissions test um, to beat the state uh, standard. Um, I might suggest using your own self-analysis when it comes to engineers, but um, if we're interested in engineering reports, the ones that I got off of the Baltimore County website, referring to Lansdowne High School, uh, reflect uh, pretty bad conditions, uh, some of which may not be fixed in a renovation. Uh, crowded hallways, the T's that are worse than the beltway, um, undersized classrooms, and on scales of one to five, many ones and twos, I found two categories that were rated five. One of them was the fire alarm system, was about the best uh, we could do. Um, so a lot of these things aren't going away. Um, they are addressing undersized classrooms in one instance. The TV studio will get bigger because they're deleting a classroom. So uh, that's the solution on that. Um, so here's some recent history. Uh, 
approximately 60 feet of hallway, jackhammered, removed the concrete to get rid of a leaky water pipe in the ground. Um, they ran the pipe up and over the ceiling. Um, how much money did this cost? Uh, it's not renovation money. What happens when the next 60 feet of pipe go? Uh, you can't do that with the drains. Drains can't be run over the ceiling. So any system that doesn't get touched by a renovation is a ticking time bomb. So um, I'm going to ask the board, if you have not done so already, to take one hour out of your day, it's $100 million one hour, to drive to Dundalk High School, take five minutes, just set your watch, walk through the hallways, drive 95 to, to Lansdowne High School and take the si same five minute walk and let the building speak for itself. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cynthia Boyd. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm a parent of multiple children in BCPS. I reviewed the, with interest the slides on uh, achievement that you'll hear about later this evening. I found myself with more questions than answers and I hope these comments are helpful as you reflect on what kind of data the community of BCPS needs to see in order to understand what our highest priorities should be for the coming years. There is a statement on one slide that the Lighthouse Schools have led the way, and another says they are outperforming the others. These words imply um, big gains and differences, but the difference seems seem very modest and mixed to me, <coughs> and there are additional analyses <coughs> that I believe would be helpful. And I can't help but wonder what the effect would be of smaller class sizes or more human supports, like reading <coughs> specialists for students with learning differences, more behavioral interventionists, more social workers. What if adult assistants received a living wage and had benefits and could afford to stay in their roles for the long term, building lasting relationships with students and teachers? Adult assistants play a vital role in so many classrooms. STAT is very expensive. There's no question that there's a role for technology in schools, but I believe we could make crucial resources available for a wider range of needs if we did not have a one-to-one -one ratio in elementary school beginning in first grade. And if we were all more skeptical when evaluating million-dollar contracts um, uh, of the claims that ed tech vendors make in their marketing materials. There is a very important voice I would like to be more included in the evaluation of STAT, and that is the voice of parents. Parents are worried about screen time, about gamification, about device use during recess, as well as the limited of amount of recess students get in general, and how personalized learning increasingly feels like depersonalized learning when our children spend less time learning with teachers. Some examples, students, children are not supposed to ask adults for help, parents or <coughs> teachers, when they are doing Dreambox or iReady. This is not a BCPS decision or a school or a teacher decision. It's in the materials that come from the companies. I cannot wrap my mind about how this is okay in elementary or middle school or how we can possibly call this personalized learning. In at least one of the programs used by BCPS, Ascend Math, the teacher in the classroom cannot override the placement the algorithm gives a student, even if he or she knows that it's not appropriate. This is not personalized learning and it's devaluing our wonderful teachers. The most valuable tool in resource we have in BCPS are people, our teachers and all the humans that support them in educating and caring for our children. The human connection is the most important thing for learning and well-being. Alfie Cohen said it best, I think, in 2014, personal learning entails working with each child to create projects of intellectual discovery that reflect his or her unique needs and interests. It requires the presence of a caring teacher who knows each child well. Personalized learning entails adjusting the difficulty level of prefabricated skill-based exercises based on student test scores. It requires the purchase of software from one of those companies that can afford full-page ads in Education Week. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hillary Martell. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Hilary Martell. I'm the mother of a first grader and a kindergartner in a Baltimore County school. I'm here as their advocate and as an advocate for the hundreds of other parents who are asking for a minimum of 40 minutes of recess each day for our children. Every fall as our young children begin school, I often hear parents saying things like, he's so exhausted at the end of the day, he just can't keep it together when he gets home. Or her behavior is so suddenly bad that she gets off the bus, yet her teacher says she's doing great at school. 
typically the response to this is, don't worry, this always happens. They get used to it in a few months. Have we ever stopped to ask ourselves if something is wrong, that this has become a nearly universal reaction to our children starting school? Our kids are coming home and melting down before our eyes. Well-behaved kids suddenly th throwing tantrums because they've just spent the last six hours, or potentially eight if you ride the bus, in an environment where everything they do is controlled. Six hours for a five-year-old to sit where you're told, stand where you're told, speak when you're told, write what you're told. The only break our kids are given is recess, and in six hours, they are getting 20 minutes of recess. It has to be more, and it has to come from you. Teachers often tell me more recess is impossible when they are required by BCPS to meet certain time requirements on particular subjects or tasks, such as Dreambox. I get it. Our kids need math, and they need to learn how to read and write. I'm not suggesting those aren't essentials to, pre to preparing our kids for the future. I am suggesting, however, that if we want our kids to become truly better students, better problem solvers, independent thinkers, empathetic to others, more well-behaved, and yes, great at math and literacy, then we need to give them more recess. In elementary schools where recess was increased to 60 minutes per day, teachers noticed not only that the kids were more focused and behavior problems got better, but that the students were able to move through the curriculum more quickly than when more instruction time was devoted to the subject. It seems counterintuitive, yet the evidence suggests if you truly want our kids to learn, they need to play. Recess is not optional, frivolous, or a luxury. It is, as the American Academy of Pediatrics says, crucial. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Sharon Saroff. Good evening. Good evening. Last, last time you heard me give you a list of concerns, and I have been very busy working on those concerns, and that's why you guys haven't heard from me in the interim but I'm gonna to try to give you some solutions along the way because those concerns are coming up more and more. I have never in 13 years been as busy as I am every single day as I am this year. Something needs to change. First, I'm gonna say thank you because the Director of Special Ed Transportation got in contact with me last week, and now we are trying to solve problems. Problems like putting students from a level five high school, level five meaning that they cannot learn in a regular public school on the same special ed bus as some young middle schoolers with special needs. Doesn't make sense, doesn't mix. We need to solve that. Communication is paramount. Parents didn't know about that particular situation with their bus until they ch their children told them, we're being teased physically and verbally. That's a problem. If I'm a parent and I do not know how to get my child services because he has special needs, he doesn't have an IEP, I need to know where to go. And most of my clients come to me because I know the process and they don't. And I have to tell them that the first thing they do is go to their principal. Well, if the principal doesn't know the process, how is the principal going to be able to help that parent? That is what we are facing in a lot of the schools, that the principals do not know the process, that the principals do not know the law, and they do not know how to dr address the concerns of these kids. We need to give professional development to these principals, to the administrators. We need to give parents the ability 
and the information so that they can walk the ladder and contact whoever needs to be contacted. And that includes the community superintendents who I have to go through a lot of loop jump hoops to find out how to get a hold of them. Again, that needs to be fixed. Thank you. Our final speaker <coughs> is Howard Libet. Fine tie you have, Mr. Libet. I've noticed yours too. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Howard Libet. I'm executive director of the Baltimore Jewish Council and also the proud parent of two children here in the county schools. Later this evening, you're going to be presented with the start of the 2018 19 calendar process. There are differences between the two options that are before you, but among the most significant is whether the county schools and offices should be open or closed for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, we all know this is not a decision based on religious sensitivity or respect for any particular religion. It had the courts and the law have made it clear it has to be based on operational needs. And I hope tonight you'll ask the staff that are presenting the calendar option some of those tough operational questions that ought to be addressed. Specifically, what are their assumptions in terms of the number of teacher absences we're going to have that day? Conservatively, I've heard anywhere between 12, 15, 18 percent of the county's teachers are Jewish and would likely take off for those holidays. What are the plans? How are you going to find enough subs to cover that? And if you can, where's the money going to come from? Are you all planning to ask the county executive or the governor for supplemental money to cover the additional cost of substitute teachers next year? If not, or if there's no plan to find enough subs, are we going to go back to the days where we herded children into the auditorium or cafeteria all day on those holidays, back when the schools were open, but there weren't enough teachers to staff all the classrooms? What's the cost to that lost educational time? Because remember, we still only have 180 days, and if we choose to open that day, my kid only has 180 days in fifth grade next year. That's not, there's no specific dollar price tag, but it's not a price tag to ignore. I, as a taxpayer, as a parent, and as the executive director of the Baltimore Jewish Council, I hope you'll press the staff for some of these questions so we can have an informed debate over the coming weeks as, as you all make a decision on the calendar. Thank you again for your, your, the opportunity tonight, for all you do for our children, and I stand ready to help however I can as you all uh, make your decision in the coming months. Thanks. Thank you. Next on our agenda. Uh, item F is personnel matters, and I ask Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, members of the board. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve personnel matters as presented in exhibits F1 and F2? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda, administrative appointments. And Superintendent White. Thank you. Chairman Gillis, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. <coughs> Coordinator of Related Services, Office of Special <coughs> Education. Director of School Climates, Office of Special Education. Manager, Department of School Safety, and Senior Business Analyst, Department of Administrative Services. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit G? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion is well carries. Superintendent, it's back to you. Okay, thank you. I'd like to present to you the following um, new appointees, and I'd ask them to stand along with their families to be recognized. First, we have Sharon Brinkley Parker, Parker, who will be the new Director of School Climate, Office of Special Education. Do you have friends or family with you here this evening? Very good. Congratulations. I'd also like to congratulate Kelly Coates, who will be the manager in the Department of School Safety. <laughs> Kelly, we have here with you. Very 
very good. Congratulations. We also have Amelia Henschel, who will be the Senior Business Analyst, Department of Administrative Services. Do you have anyone here with you this evening? Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to congratulate Marin Townsend, who will be the Coordinator of Related Services, Office of Special Education. And I think you have a whole cheering section back there. Would you like to introduce them? <laughs> okay. Congratulations. That ends our administrative appointments. Mr. Very good. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is item H, action taken in closed section session. And I invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Good evening. Whenever you Happens come again, forward, people will walk out. <laughs> that's, what, that's my role, I guess. Invite me up and the room clears out. <laughs> um, earlier this evening, the board considered rather three appeals regarding confidential uh, employee and student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. One was an oral argument where the board heard from the parties. Two were considered on the record as there were no requests made for oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken by the board in closed session in those matters. The oral argument was hearing examiner number 17-55. The summary affirmances uh, were uh, hearing examiner numbers 17-51 and 18-03. Is there a motion to approve the action taken in closed session of the matters that Mr. Nussbaum has described? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank Nussbaum. you. And the orders okay. are on the very good. The orders are on the table for a signature. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next on our agenda is item I. And I ask Dr. Mayo and Mr. Duke to come forward to present the proposed uh, first reader of the 2018-2019 school calendar. Good evening again. Good evening. <laughs> Doctor. We're here this evening to uh, present the 2018-2019 proposed school calendar for Baltimore <coughs> County Public Schools. Each year during this time period, the Board of Education is presented with a proposed calendar for the upcoming school year. As outlined in Superintendent's Rule 6301, the Board of Education must be presented with a proposed calendar by the first October board meeting, regular board meeting, and must adopt the calendar by the November board meeting. This evening, we will be presenting two options to the proposed 2018-19 school year calendar, with this board meeting serving as the first reader. Two readers will follow this particular reader um, at a later date. The next board meeting, and then of course the first, um, excuse me, the second meeting in October will be for the final reader. Last year at this time, we presented the board with three options, with the board approving option B as the option that we are in for this particular school year. Noted within Superintendent's Rule 6000, 301, the superintendent is responsible for convening a calendar committee comprised of various stakeholders to develop a calendar, proposed calendar. The calendar committee is led by Mr. George Duke, who serves as the facilitator to conduct meetings of the committee. For the 1819 school year calendar, the committee met three times to discuss various options. Each school, school quarter is divided in, into, each quarter, school is divided into quarters, uh, ranging from 45 to 40, 49 days each quarter. The committee must also take into consideration several requirements as outlined within the Code of Maryland Re Regulations, also known as COMAR, as well as the education article as the calendar is developed each year. Once the committee develops a proposed calendar, it is then presented to the board as we are tonight with the board approving um, by the third reader and then it will be posted on the, um, on the website of the school system. The calendar committee is comprised of various stakeholders such as representatives from our five collective bargaining units, superintendents, designee staff, uh, such as principals, CNI staff, and also invited stakeholders such as area advisory committee members as well. 
I would like to take this time personally to thank all of those members who served on the calendar committee this past school year um, to put the proposed calendar together that you will be um, seeing this evening. As mentioned earlier, Baltimore County Public Schools, as well as all other school districts within the state of Maryland, we are all bound by constraints at the state level when it comes to developing a calendar. Some of those constraints include the school year must start after Labor Day. The school year must end by June 15th. And we must have a minimum of 180 student days, as well as a minimum of 1,080 instructional hours for middle and elementary school students and a minimum of 1,170 instructional hours for high school students. Under the proposed calendar options for the 1819 school year, students will be in session for 187 student days at the middle and high school level and 186 student days at the elementary level due to a elementary um, conference day during the month of November. In each of the options, well, excuse me, I should say, in each of the days for elementary, middle, and high school students, we have built in five inclement weather days into the calendar. In the event we do not use all of our inclement weather days, such as this past school year, we're then able to adjust our school calendar so that we can end our school year earlier. Along with the day and hour requirements I've mentioned in some of the previous slides, we also have mandated state holidays for all public schools. Those include Thanksgiving and the day after, Christmas Eve through January 1st, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, President's Day, Friday before Easter and Monday after Easter, Memorial Day, and primary and general election days. Those equate to 16 days during that time period wherein schools can actually be in session. As Dr. Mayo stated, the school calendar must have a minimum of 180 student days. In addition to this requirement, all Maryland school districts must meet a minimum number of student contact hours. For high schools, that is 1,170 hours, and for elementary and middle schools, it is 1,080 hours. Because BCPS has a six and a half hour student day, the calendar normally includes additional days beyond the minimum of 180 days. Also, the student days shown on this slide include the five inclement weather emergency closure days that we typically build into the calendar. Therefore, the total number of student days is the required 180 plus two additional days for middle and high schools and one additional day for elementary schools and the five, elementary clo uh, the five emergency closure days for a total of 187 days. The total hours shown represent the 187 days times the six and a half hour student day for a total of the student hours for the high, middle, and elementary schools. Before commenting on this slide, I need to make a slight correction. In the, middle high, in the high school column for both options, A and B, the number of shortened days, which is the fifth row down, should read one and not zero. The slide, this slide compares the calendar committee's recommendation, option A, and the option B alternative. It walks you through the computation that MSDE makes in evaluating the school system's calendar. I would ask that you focus on the numbers in the high school column since it is in this area that we potentially could have difficulty in meeting the state requirements. The starting number of total student days differs between option A and option B. While option A starts with 180 student days, option B starts with a total of 181. I also would call your attention to how, in student hours, the two options differ. After backing out the five emergency closure days and the scheduled shortened days, option A has 1,180 student hours, while option B has 1,173.5 hours. After subtracting the required 1,170 hours, we would be left with a balance of 10 hours in option A and only three and a half hours in option B to address any unscheduled delayed openings or early releases. This slide shows what is different between the two calendar options. Option A has teachers returning on Wednesday, August the 22nd, while teachers return on Tuesday, August 21st in option B. In 2018, September 10th and 19th are the dates of the Jewish holidays. Option A calls for schools and offices to be open, 
while option B has the school system closing on both days. And the final difference is the length of the spring break. Option A has spring break beginning at the end of classes on Wednesday, April 17th, affording teachers and students with an additional day off. In option B, spring break begins at the end of classes on Thursday, April 18th, giving teachers and students the required public school holidays of Good Friday and Easter Monday. This slide provides you with a comparison between the 17-18 school year calendar and the two options being presented for your consideration this evening. I would call your attention to the fact that unlike the 17-18 calendar, which only has one Jewish holiday falling on a weekday, the 18-19 school year calendar has two. Additionally, there is an election day on November 6, 2018. These differences account for the 13 student hour difference between the 17-18 school year calendar and option A, and the 19 and a half hour difference between the 17-18 calendar and option B. As you can see, the task of developing a school calendar can be a challenging one. The calendar committee each year must keep in mind um, when developing a calendar that they are mandated by the number of high school hours when creating a calendar. We also have to keep in mind that Baltimore County public school students only attend school 6.5 hours each day, the lowest in the state of Maryland. With those limited hours, it impacts what we can do with the calendar as far as the flexibility with the calendar. Additional days are embedded within our calendar to ensure, ensure days are, that we have days in, embedded within the calendar, such as what Mr. Duke mentioned about the 180-day minimum requirement. In order to meet the hour requirement, we have to build in additional days outside of that 180-day uh, requirement in order for us to meet the hour requirement in Baltimore County. So that's why you saw the 182 and 183 days instead of just the 180 days as far as for the minimum number of days. And also, as mentioned, the uh, calendar committee's recommendation, which was, which was option A, leaves us with a balance of 10 hours, whereas the um, option B would leave us with a balance of 3.5 hours. At this time, we'll entertain any questions. And before, we, um, ask, before you ask any questions, I did receive one question um, earlier today uh, regarding when was the last time Actually, excuse me, it states where we closed last year, I mean the 2015-16 school year for the Jewish holidays. And the answer to that is yes. Um, those holidays during that particular year were actually during the month of um, October. Um, the last time Baltimore County Public Schools opened, or was actually open during the Jewish holidays, uh, was actually the 1994-1995 school year. Since that time period, we've actually been closed. Does any board member have a question or a comment for either Dr. Mayer or Mr. Duke at this time? Ms. Eaton. I'll find it out. Will remaining open on the Jewish holidays really be a financial catastrophe it's, for our school system? It, it's really hard to answer that question, Ms. Eaton, because since 1995, the school system has been closed on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, so it's hard to really answer that question and say, yes, there will be a financial impact that would hurt the system. Mr. Yulfa. Uh, one more. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Eaton has another question. How many substitutes do you think would be a good number that we would say, okay, we will, we will um, remain open and we have this many substitutes? Like, is there a number of substitutes that you would stop and say, okay, we will have to close the schools on that day? Well, we, we range on a daily basis anywhere from 700 to 1,000 um, absences. Um, so it's, that's, that's on average. Really? We, yes. So it's, it's kind of hard to kind of, as I say, it's hard to gauge that question because I don't, we don't have any way of tracking a person's religious affiliation. Okay, thanks. Ms. Josie had her hand up. Okay. Ms. Schaefer. Um, <coughs> so I guess I'm kind of nervous <coughs> about staying open for Jewish holidays. Um, on the Friday that we were open, the yeah. hallways seemed pretty empty, and I don't know how that would affect schools that aren't necessarily in the Northwest area. So you said you don't track like religious affiliation. So do you not know how many students in BCPS um, are Jewish? No, no you don't. Yeah, we don't. Okay. Um, so I guess my question then is, if we stay open, what does the school day look like on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? Like, if the teachers are absent and there's a large group of students absent, 
how does that affect learning for the students? What are the students supposed to do if their English teacher or their math teacher is absent and so is half their class in some cases? Well, in cases like that, we would hope just like of any other day when someone's absent, they would put in for their, their leave for that particular day and hopefully we will be able to find and secure enough substitutes to, in order for the school day to function as it would normally. Okay, thank you. Mr. Yulfoder and then Mrs. Miller. Okay, um, I, I had supplied many years ago uh, some numbers that were um, developed out of the 2010 uh, Associated Jewish Charities survey. Um, I was around during the early 90s when, when we decided to, when, when the system decided to close for the holidays. And um, the number of teachers, the biggest effect monetarily will be on teachers, on substitute teachers. Um, I, I believe that probably 15 percent is probably uh, a good number. I think it could be a little bit higher. But if we have 15 percent uh, of the 9,000, we're talking about in round figures 1,400, <coughs> the need for 1,400 substitutes for the first day. Uh, let, me t let me say this, and I've said it before publicly, that there are many uh, Jewish uh, individuals who celebrate Rosh Hashanah on two days. And we do have statistics that show that, if my last count is right, we had about 239 teachers take a leave for the second day of Rosh Hashanah. That much, I think, we had in our uh, PRC review two years ago. We had those hard numbers. So um, if you're on an average daily basis, you're talking about a minimum of 700. And if you had another 1,400 uh, Jewish teachers the first day, you could be talking upwards to 2,000. Um, I think the substitute rate cost us about $140 a day. We could be talking about $1.8 million. It's 91. Huh? $91 a day. Is that all? Oh, yes. Uh, pretty cheap. <laughs> okay, so we're, we'll be talking about about a, probably a million three, a million four, give or take. So there's a, it's always been a, a real <coughs> financial number. It's, been, it's, it's always been a result of the economic uh, burden on the system, either actual dollars or the fact that uh, you'll have buses running with two and three students, which I've seen, uh, and you'll have classrooms where you'll need subs, and the question is, will you be able to? And as a result, uh, the numbers back in the 90s suggested that we it would save the system substantial amount of money uh, by closing for the, the two days, a minimum, the, the maximum, rather, of two days a year. So I just throw that out. I mean, the, 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 you know, the only way you're going to find out is if you, if you invoke uh, um, A and uh, you see what happens. But it could be costly. Mrs. Miller. Well, it will be. Let me put it that way. I know it will be. Mrs. Miller. And <coughs> yeah, 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 Thank you. Uh, last year, uh, the PRC attempted to resolve this issue, and um, the board voted their solution, their recommendation down. Um, however, I did make a motion 13 months ago um, to direct the PRC to revisit the issue for all religious holidays, not just. Uh, at the time, we were just considering the, the Muslim holidays. Um, and the motion was to define what uh, our secular purpose is, establish a threshold for meeting it, and provide data to support it. Uh, since then, the board has not acted on that motion, which we passed unanimously. So my first question actually is to the chair of the um, policy committee, uh, whether that's something that's on the radar in the near future or really In fact, it is not on the radar. Secondly, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. This counters before the board right now. Whatever your motion would be to follow your convictions, the strongly held beliefs that you may have on this matter that has driven you to this point with your patience well, now is the time to act on it. Make those motions for the board to decide, rather than send it over here, wait some more, send it over there. And there are other priorities. I don't know if you had an opportunity to even speak with the prior chair 
of the PRC committee. I can tell you the PRC has already had one meeting and we moved through some things. I certainly will do whatever the members of the PRC committee will do, but I certainly won't lecture them about what their duty is and how they should act. My unsolicited advice to you is make a motion. If the votes are there, the board will take action and resolve it now rather than delay. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I wasn't uh, lecturing anyone, but uh, if you look at it that way, that's your decision. Um, I realize that you are new in the position of chair, um, and that's why I gave you a heads up that I would be asking about this. Um, for me to make another motion about a motion that's already been passed, I'm not sure is the right way to go. That's why I'm asking the question. Um, I do believe that it is something we should address right now, and maybe we can get something accomplished in the Policy Review Committee to address this issue and resolve it for all religious holidays. So if I, if I may just add on that, Mrs. Miller, mm -hmm. um, you've heard from our, our speakers here that they don't keep or are unable to keep records about the religious preferences of either teachers or students. So to ask for empirical evidence is probably a request that's impossible to satisfy. Well, it depends on how it's defined by the policy committee. That would be up to them. All right. Uh, I did have a couple other comments. Um, I did receive quite a bit of input from teachers on the calendar, and I wanted to share the comments that I, I received. Um, some suggested that the calendar should specify how much time of the teacher set up days uh, prior to the start of the school year. Uh, would be for a teacher classroom setup time and how much would be for meetings or professional development. So there was a lot of concern <coughs> that there's just too many meetings and that's using up all of the classroom setup time. So that would be just something to consider and I wanted to pass that on. Several teachers also expressed that the eight prep days before school for option A, and I'm only speaking on option A because Option B um, is, uh, includes being closed for the Jewish holidays, and since we have not settled that issue, I don't believe that we can legally consider it, since it would be in violation of state law. Um, so some teachers expressed that the eight prep days before school could be reduced to six, and then two could be taken at the end of the school year in June in order to close out grades, move classrooms, and have some professional development. Uh, apparently, uh, they expressed that we're one of the only local uh, school systems in the state that does not have teachers report after the end of the school year. So I just wanted to throw those um, suggestions out that came from teachers. Thank you. And before, before I go to Mr. McDaniels, uh, for the last 22 years, I think Mr. Dr. Mayo said, uh, Baltimore County has closed on uh, the, the two holidays um, in either September or October, depending on the year, uh, and it's not illegal. Uh, Mr. McDaniels. Um, thank you. I just had a question for Dr. Mayo about inclement weather days. You mentioned um, it's last year we did not use um, more than five. I think that's what you implied or whatever. But it seems like traditionally we <coughs> needed more than five inclement weather days. Um, do you have any general comment about what is typical uh, for the number of days that we actually need? It, it varies, obviously. It's dependent upon the weather. But in the 13-14 school year, we used nine. In the 14-15 school year, we used six. In the 15-16, we used seven. And in the 16-17 school year, which was an anomaly, we only used two. Okay, thank you. And if I could just uh, comment on um, the issue that one of the teachers brought up as far as the number of days that are dedicated to classroom setup. Contractually, teachers are to be given two days, two full days, either half days, um, but they must equate to f two full days to set up their classrooms. 
Thank you. That's helpful. All right, Mr. Yulefeld. Yeah, I just looked around uh, the board, and I think other than Mr. McDaniels, I'm, he and I are the only ones that were uh, members of the board maybe three years ago when PRC spent a little over five months in developing uh, the uh, situation relative to the Jewish holidays. And I would recommend that uh, at this point in time that we just defer any more discussion and that a copy of that report, which was yay thick, with all the data that you could use, and I sincerely doubt if I remember the data that you'll see <laughs> any uh, material change uh, from the numbers then, and we actually had public hearings as well. Uh, I suggested everybody on the board get a copy of that and review it, and then we, we, we probably can have a more fruitful discussion without wasting a lot of time. Could, could we get a copy I, of that? I'm, sure. Yeah, I think, uh, I other think you'll find it. questions or comments? <laughs> Mrs. Causey. Mr. Duke, uh, in the presentation, you talked about the um, calendar committee meeting and the members that were involved in it, collective bargaining units, the superintendent staff designees and invited stakeholders. Could you tell me how many people uh, attended the meetings, how many meetings were there, and how many people attended each meeting? We had uh, three meetings. Um, they were uh, held on uh, April the 24th, and we had 18 in attendance. Uh, we had a meeting on May the 1st, and there were 15 in attendance. Uh, and then uh, we were asked to convene again, and we did so on September 14th, and we had eight in, eight in attendance. So the eight in the so the eight in attendance voted on option A. Was there what, a vote, or is it just you had discussion and then you as we returned, we reconvened the uh, calendar committee um, at the behest of the superintendent. Um, because of the considerations that she wanted to make sure that the calendar committee had taken into account, those being obviously the whether to stay open or to close, um, and the concerns were the fiscal impact and also the, uh, the safety impact or security impact and having uh, sufficient supervisory staff in schools to supervise students adequately. Um, and what the a meeting on the 14th was, uh, the 14th of September was to go ahead and revisit um, the recommendation that had been made by the committee to the, to the superintendent and to ensure that uh, we had discussed and we had taken into account those concerns, which we had um, in the two previous meetings. Uh, we had long discussions um, relative to the <coughs> Uh, fiscal impact and the degree of substitutes that may be needed and the absenteeism that may occur uh, or could occur if we were to remain uh, open. Um, and uh, the committee still uh, felt that uh, the original recommendation was the recommendation that they wanted to bring to the board. Okay, so because we, <coughs> Mrs. White is our new interim superintendent. She was appointed after May 15th and so uh, after May. Yes, I'll speak to that. So, so again, the committee's recommendation was to remain open on the Jewish holidays. I, again, as Mr. Duke said, I wanted to make sure that we had taken into account all of the um, the other kinds of considerations that we think about instructionally. I, I think that Ms. Schaefer spoke to as well. And so I've asked, I asked the committee to reconvene to consider those things yet again. But the committee's recommendation, I believe it was on May 1st, First, correct? correct. Uh, was to remain open on those days. So it was just another attempt just to make sure that that was indeed the committee's recommendation. And as the committee's recommendation, I felt it was our responsibility, especially since we had uh, you know, folks volunteering their time to serve on the committee to make sure that they're looking at the hours. I know that we've talked a lot about teacher days, but what's at stake, really, the issue has to do with student hours, particularly high school student hours. And so we wanted to make sure that we're um, honoring the committee's recommendation by bringing the committee's recommendation to the full board for consideration. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And that uh, leads me to my second question, which is the number of the hours of our high school day. So, uh, Dr. Mayor, you mentioned it's 6.5 yes, hours per hours. day. So what is the average for other school systems in the state? It ranges anywhere from um, 
most school systems are probably six hours and 45 minutes, um, probably around eight or so school districts, and then we have a handful that are seven hours long. Okay, so so for the average, let's say 6.75 6 6 is the difference. Have you calculated what the uh, year-long instructional time difference is? Yes, if we kept the calendar as is and we added, if we had a 6.75 hour day and we kept the calendar as is, we would actually have um, an option A, a balance of 55.5 hours, which equates to like 8.2 days. And in option B, you would have a balance of 49 hours, which equates to about 7.25 days. Okay, thank you for that. My concern is number one, the operational issues related to the school calendar, but also in general, for our students and our teachers that are trying to achieve and compete at the high school level where they're taking advanced placement classes or their uh, GT classes or honors classes and they're some, in some cases doing SAT prep and taking the SAT, that our students um, may be at a disadvantage if they are not receiving the same instructional time as their counterparts in the state. So that's a, so thank you for that information because that is, um, that is important to know. Um, I did have one other question. Um, Mr. Ufelder had mentioned the work of the Policy Review Committee uh, under the former chair, Romaine Williams, and I was wondering, um, I believe that report is online. It is, it's on the website. But there was also a public hearing that she held. Um, was that recorded and also online, or is that not available? I'd have to check. If you could I check if there's maybe minutes to that meeting, um, Mr. Ufelder mentioned a hearing. It was no. December of the year. Okay, that, that would be helpful just to review. And uh, what I recall from that, um, the work that was done is that there was language, um, and I don't know whether it was a direction or a recommendation to the superintendent at the time, that on the uh, Muslim holidays that did not receive days off, um, that there would be no field trips, no exams. So if those students chose to observe their holiday, that they would not be, um, they would not be negatively Im impacted in, in severe ways. So I'm curious if that direction or recommendation to the superintendent would be considered to be added to the calendar um, if to the option where schools would be open on the, on the Jewish holidays. So that if um, students and teachers take those days off that there are not significant educational um, issues that they have to deal with. So is that a consideration of the committee or is that a consideration we can ask them to look at adding? Uh, well, it definitely it can be added and annotated, um, but also MSDE has directives and they have a calendar of um, religious holidays on which uh, students are testing is not to take place and where students are to be given um, uh, leeway, if you will, um, relative to academics um, if they choose to be absent on those days. But definitely, yes, we could always add, um, as we do um, for the Muslim holidays, we can add uh, a footnote to the calendar. So does MSDE have that as a, a recommendation or as a requirement for LEA? It is posted, no, it is posted on their website and it is, it's a standing, um, Policy. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Young. There's been discussion about the number of hours as far as six and a half versus six hours, 45 minutes. Um, with some of our bargaining units like TAPCO, there is a, in their contract, it says they can work X number of days. But in their contract, does it limit their, um, the number of hours within a day? Yes, it does. Okay, so even trying to change it, you, we would have to go back and that would also be a financial impact to the system. Thank you. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Just a quick question about weather again. Um, if we uh, exceed the number of budgeted inclement weather days, I know we can ask for a waiver from the state superintendent or someone to be satisfied with wherever we are, but if we are we ever denied that waiver and have to extend the school year? And if so, how much does it cost if we have to extend the school year because we haven't satisfied the hours uh, per day or whatever? Well, we have a new twist this, uh, this year because the governor's executive order has a start date and an end date. 
So we need to begin the, the Tuesday after Labor Day, and we need to be done by June 15. They're waived. Um, so, no, yeah, so okay. um, never mind. Actually, <laughs> because of that, because of that, all of the or maybe all, almost all of the professional development days are front-loaded before the school year begins. That's correct. Yes. So if there was an extra 15 minutes or an extra 70 hours or whatever you said uh, in the school year, teachers would have an opportunity for professional development days during the school year. We could embed in professional development days throughout the school year. I believe it may have been the case in many years ago, but yes. um, since our hands are pretty tied as far as the hour requirement, we've had to take away a lot of those days and front-load them. Right. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Mr. Stewart hasn't spoken. Well, I think it'll be quick, but the point is we've also received instruction, have we not, as it relates to the waiver process and what would happen if inclement weathers overtake our schedule, that uh, inclement weather days, that there really isn't tremendous flexibility or even that much flexibility in our waiver process. Is that well, correct? Well, in the, in the past, um, in order to, let's say, receive a waiver, the state wants to wants the school system to show that they've tried to make some type of good faith effort to maybe arrange some days that may have been a holiday um, or some type of day off like so let's say a professional development day for teachers wherein students were out we we would then alter it and say this is not going to be a student school day we don't have that flexibility within that calendar because of we're basically off by the bare minimum basically the mandated holidays and we don't have any other days to really be flexible so the state would kind of look at that negatively because we don't have a way of really adjusting that calendar though i mean though there'd be arguments about spring break about taking other measures that are unique to the last few years as opposed to you know years before that where it showcases a, a willingness to be serious about abiding by the wishes but they've eliminated all the the Wiggle there's room. a state mandated Good Friday and Easter Monday, and that's what it's. That's all that's there. Right. So this, and I'm just trying to be clear though, because there was discussion at the when this was occurring with respect to Labor Day about the waiver process. But it sounds like we still have an ability to ask for it. It's just we need to have a good faith showing. That I think that was it. to be waived from the uh, <coughs> Labor Day to June 15 day, not to have a waiver because we had too many snow days. Okay. Yeah. Um, before Mrs. Miller has the last word, I want to say that the public, the public uh, may comment on the proposed calendar options A and B on October 10, uh, and sign up uh, to speak will begin at 5.30 p.m. on that day and conclude at 6.30, and comments may also be sent to BOE public hearing at bcps.org. Mrs. Miller. I actually have a question for legal counsel regarding um, how we handle the fact that we had a motion passed and never <coughs> acted on it. What is the proper procedure then to have that motion that was passed unanimously acted on? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that it's that it, it's still before PRC, so it's it's pending. All right, but but. I would think that there would be some kind of statute of limitation on pending. All right. So we'll, we'll see what we can do about that. But uh, it, there, there hasn't been uh, action by PRC yet, and it's still on the queue of matters that PRC has. As you heard from Mr. Virch, there are plenty of other matters on PS, PRC's. Okay, uh, and in fact, the well. PRC was still, actually out I, of actually business I'm, for I'm, several I'm, months this summer. I would still have the floor, please. I, <coughs> I would still like to have an answer from legal counsel on what the proper okay, so I'll procedure we'll talk to would be. We'll talk to legal counsel and get back to you on that. One um, quick, and Mr. Yulefelder has a quick comment. To the, to, um, in, in the determination of A and B, was the potential financial cost discussed? I just want this for the record. In other words, you can we can all throw out numbers. I got a number in my head because <laughs> I was told this about a year ago. So I mean, you discussed clearly the fact that we could be talking million. We didn't talk in specific dollar amounts. We we spoke. I informed the the committee that on average the system utilizes approximately a thousand to twelve hundred subs or has a request for 1,000 to 1,200 subs per day. Um, and we didn't talk in dollar terms, but we did talk in the fact that that could represent, uh, if we remained open and needed more subs, it could represent um, a fiscal impact. 
All right. Uh, next on our agenda is item J, uh, report on student achievement, multiple measures of performance. For that, I invite Dr. Brown and Dr. Boswell McCoy. <coughs> Good evening, Chair Gillis, um, Superintendent White, members of the board and community. I'm pleased to join you this evening with Dr. Boswell McComas uh, to be able to talk about um, context and um, measures of student performance for the system. And we're going to talk about multiple measures of student performance as we go through this. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm dealing with the same sinuses and allergies that everybody <laughs> else has right now. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the context for performance um, by looking at multiple measures. Um, as many of us would think about in terms of working with students, uh, when we think about students and making decisions for students, we never want to make decisions based on a single measure for a student. We want to base those on a constellation of measures for a student. In like fashion, when you look at the health of a system uh, as large as ours, in terms of academic performance for our students, we want to look at a constellation of measures for the system as a whole and multiple measures over time, spanning kindergarten all the way to high school and beyond. In terms of context, uh, clearly there's been a shift. Uh, historically, we have the MSA, and then we've shifted to career and college readiness. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what that shift means, what it actually looks like. Uh, we've had a lot of talk about it, but maybe haven't really get dug into what it looks like. And then we're going to work through uh, starting in kindergarten and working all the way up through the system in grade bands, K3, 3, 5, 6, 8, and then into high school and beyond, looking at some of the measures that we use to, to make inferences about our student performance over time. And then when we're done with that, um, I will hand things over to Dr. Boswell McComas uh, to speak about our system and how we are going to respond and use this data to inform instruction. So um, we'll start with the apology on the front end. We have a lot of alphabet soup in education. Um, tons of acronyms, I apologize, and I just sort of want to walk through what some of these are for our general public. Um, while the board members may be very aware of this, I don't know that everyone else in our audience necessarily is familiar with all these terms. Uh, and so we're going to talk about sort of the what and the why of assessment. What do we do and why is it, why is it there? Is it something that we've selected to do internally or is it something that was imposed um, as a state measure? So we're going to start with the kindergarten readiness assessment. It um, assesses a broad array of skills in social foundations, language, literacy, mathematics, and physical development and well-being. It's a state-mandated assessment. It's our entry point. It's sort of our baseline for our student achievement uh, in our system. From there, uh, historically, we had the MSAs and the HSAs, um, the Maryland School Assessments. They were the federal accountability measures uh, used for reading and mathematics uh, and science across the state. And, and again, state and federally imposed, and they informed uh, a trajectory towards graduation. Uh, they really helped us understand whether or not kids were on track for what I would call our first opportunity threshold, and that was graduation. We've moved since then to PARC, uh, <laughs> which is the Partnership for Assessment of Reading uh, Readiness for um, College and Careers. Um, like the MSA, it's, it's a state and federally mandated assessment that gives us information on reading and mathematics performance, but it aligns to the career and college readiness threshold. It aligns to a different opportunity threshold for, for students, a higher bar than graduation alone. We also have the MAP assessments, uh, which are the measures of academic progress. It's an NWA tool. It's a system-initiated benchmark tool that we use to measure growth and achievement against a national normative sample of about 10 million students. And it's helped us benchmark towards career and college readiness as we were uh, transitioning to PARC. We also have the PSAT and the SAT, um, Scholastic Aptitude Test. Um, the one, the pre PSAT, enables us to measure uh, It's a self-imposed assessment. It's one that we use to measure our students' progress in terms of career and college readiness moving 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. It also lets us to identify students who are um, prepared to take AP coursework and it allows us to, to have students um, practice for the SAT and also uh, become eligible in some cases for the National Merit Scholarship. 
The SAT, we give in 11th grade. It's given in the spring of 11th grade, and it's an opportunity for all our students to participate in a career and college readiness measure uh, that they can use for college admission. And it, and it gives all our students that opportunity to, to participate in that. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, CTE measures, uh, career and technical education. Um, we have uh, many students in our system who are enrolled in career and technical education courses, and um, many of those uh, are leaving the system uh, with industry certifications and industry standards, and I think it's, it's worth talking about that as we get there. And then finally, when we talk about career and college readiness, um, ultimately the goal is to have students be prepared to go on to college uh, and to be able to perform at a B minus or above level when, when they get to college. And the measure for that in the long run is, you know, what's our college enrollment rate and what's our persistence rate? Uh, because persistence really gets at whether or not kids were prepared uh, to be able to go to college and then move into the second year of college as they move forward. So, to try to get at this idea that, that we're really talking about two different trajectories, we put this together this uh, illustration for folks. And if you look at the, the lower line with the little gray dots, that's the historic MSA HSA line. That's the trajectory that helps students prepare for graduation. Again, it was what I would call our first opportunity threshold for students. Um, we are very fortunate that in the past year, our African-American white students graduated at <coughs> virtually identical rates across the system. It's a wonderful thing to have achieved. We have closed graduation rates, and our graduation rate has gone up consistently over time. That threshold is meaningful. Students who graduate from high school have about twice the earning potential of students who do not. And the second threshold there, if you take a look at it, so you know, that's the lower one. If we go to the upper one, we um, introduced MAP about four years ago to be able to track towards the PSAT, which are the little blue dots up at the top, and SAT. We can equate PSAT performance and SAT performance and work that backwards to understand whether or not students are on trajectory for career and college readiness using those tools. It was our first way to begin to measure towards that uh, difference and first way to communicate to our schools that gap between what they had experienced with the MSA and what they were going to experience with PARC. So we'll carry these dots forward throughout the, the rest of the presentation, sort of showing which measures are, are associated with different things along the way. Our current model, you'll see, has taken some things away. So all the MSA, all those little gray dots and HSA dots have gone away. Um, and you will see that we've retained MAP as part of that trajectory to career and college readiness. We have introduced the kindergarten readiness assessment. It's our new baseline. And the park assessments exist in grades three through eight in high school to be able to allow us to project towards career and college readiness as measured by park. Again, we see a gap there, and we see a gap between you know, this idea of what, what it took to graduate, what it takes to graduate, and what it takes to be able to perform at a B minus or, or better level in college. And you know, what does that really look like in terms of items when we start to, to look at that? And I, again, I think the best way to understand that is to just really take a look at some of the items on the MSA, PARC, and SAT. So this is a classic item off of the old MSA, and it's a math item from sixth grade. It, Sorry, this is making me it's nervous. Familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so familiar. <laughs> so, what, what I'd like you to, to notice from this, I'm sorry to impose anxiety upon anybody. Yeah, assessments do that sometimes to folks. Um, what I'd like you to notice is one, this is not a text rich item. This is a fairly simple, straightforward item. Uh, it gets a perimeter. Uh, it, can, it can be solved with a simple algorithm. Uh, back in the day, my uh, math teachers would call this a plug and chug item. You know, they give you a whole sheet of them and, and ask you to run the formula so you'd memorize the formula and be able to work through it. It's a very straightforward item. And note that there is one correct answer to this item. This is a new item. This is uh, a sixth grade park item. Now, this item um, gets a similar concept. It's not perimeter. In this case, it's area. Uh, what I would point out first is, one, that it is a little bit more text-rich than the last item. 
If you read through this item and read through it carefully, you will note there are multiple ways that you can solve this correctly. This item doesn't have a single correct answer. And this item requires solving two sets of problems. So first, I have to make a justification for why I'm solving the problem in a certain way in the first place. How am I gonna divvy this up into reasonable sized pieces that are all equal? I have to give a justification for that math. And then subsequent to that, dependent on my first answer, I also have to calculate then what the cost of each of those pieces would be. It is a substantially more complex process that requires students to be able to understand and justify the responses in context. And again, not a single response for this. And now we'll go on to the SAT. Uh, speaking of items that might make someone nervous. Um, <laughs> this item clearly is very text rich. This item requires uh, solving using a formula in a couple different ways. There are two parts related to the text of this item and, and you have to go back and forth with this. The point is um, the difference in terms of the level of difficulty between these is substantial. So when we talk about proficiency um, on the MSA, um, it's not the same as career and college readiness on, on part. They align to completely different opportunity thresholds. Uh, when we th really think about this again, one was aligned to what it meant to, to be prepared to, to graduate. So when we were tracking kids along that trajectory, what did it mean for a student to be on track to graduate, that first opportunity threshold? We're now moving the bar up. And we're saying, what does it mean to be on track to get a B minus or above as I, I go into coursework into college? It's a very different threshold. So we're sort of fortunate in that we've had MAP in place for both assessments. And it acts as a little bit of a Rosetta Stone between the two. And so with MAP, we can see that uh, tied to the MSA cut point for proficiency, roughly seven out of 10 kids would have been projected to be proficient on MSA, give or take uh, a little bit on grade and subject. That number gets inverted as we go to park. And it's what we see in our park results and what we see around the state. Instead of seven out of 10 students being above the threshold for, for proficiency, seven out of 10 students are roughly below the threshold for the park, career, and college readiness. They are different thresholds. They look at different outcomes. They're aligned to different outcomes. So it's a tremendous shift in expectations over time. And I, I guess what I would want the public to, to reflect upon is that when the MSA was introduced, um, student scores were initially low. And then they grew over time and we closed gaps. And then we saw that our graduation rates went up and over time we closed gaps. In like fashion, we're starting at a low point, not just us, but the state as a whole, with PARC. And we can expect that over time that we will grow and close gaps. With that context, um, let's review our students' performance. So we're gonna start with K3, and the two measures that we're gonna look here are the kindergarten readiness assessment, and we're gonna look at MAP, because those are the two measures that we have that inform us in terms of the entry point of students and also the growth and achievement in uh, grades K through three. So in terms of kindergarten readiness, um, this is not good news. Students are coming into the system uh, as the bar is raised in terms of the expectations of student uh, uh, performance, um, students are actually coming into the system less prepared. There's been a decline in kindergarten readiness over time, such that at this point, roughly six out of 10 students are not entering school prepared uh, to, to operate at this level standard. Which means that our, our teachers and our students actually have to grow more in the same amount of time just to keep up with where they were in the past. This is in part tied to poverty, and we know that there's a strong relationship between poverty and student achievement. Uh, it's been demonstrated. Matter of fact, uh, MSD recently published uh, a PowerPoint that showed that uh, across the state as a whole, that there's this strong relationship between poverty and student achievement. And we know that our, in our system, in the elementary and middle school levels uh, in particular, that our poverty rates are higher than the, the state as a whole. So students are entering less prepared, uh, we're confronted with poverty, and yet we're uh, working to close gaps over time. So looking at reading achievement, again, we're looking at MAP, and this is data that you have seen before. This is data that was presented uh, 
with our Johns Hopkins partners, and it's been presented in a couple of different ways over time. You'll see that if you go from left to right on this, um, it's kindergarten, first, second, and third grades, um, and it goes left to right in terms of time. What you will note if, if you look at this is that, yes, our kids enter kindergarten uh, below average, and then when they get to the uh, midpoint of kindergarten, we still see that delay. What you see, however, as you move through first, second, and third grade is a steady progression in student achievement as we move forward. So uh, our growth rates in these grades uh, exceed the national average uh, in between 14 and 25 percent over time, and that growth then translates to achievement. And I know uh, there was some question about the, the degree of growth and what does it mean in terms of, of student achievement. So uh, being a stickler for how to present data, um, I've, I've expressed the range of this assessment at this point. I started at, at 100, which is the, the bottom. So it makes the differences look relatively small as you move forward. Those differences, uh, which were presented in a curriculum committee uh, meeting in, let's say, I think it was March 17th of this year, um, so folks can, and the public can go back and, and view that on the web. Those differences over time in ELA amount to two to three months of instruction. Those are significant gains for our students. When we talk about our, our lighthouse schools, those gains are significant in a practical sense. There are very few things that I'm aware of that will equate to two to three months of instructional time without actually adding time to the day. A similar pattern exists for math. Again, you'll see that kindergarten scores have been flat over time. Again, we measure mid-year kindergarten. It's a baseline for us. And we see growth uh, moving onward uh, through mathematics with 20 to 27 percent growth above uh, national average in grades 1, 2, and 3. And we see, again, uh, a movement upward in grades 1, 2, and a little bit of flattening in grade 3. And that, that comes back in a different way a little bit later. So tied to the White House schools, Again, worth mentioning, um, I, we had a constituent earlier mention that um, Lighthouse schools have led the way with achievement they have. And what we've seen over time, and again, if we go back uh, to the curriculum committee meeting, you'll see um, where I've walked through in that meeting the progression of cohorts moving forward. Lighthouse schools have, for the past two years in ELA, outperformed uh, the national average, which actually shows up here. <laughs> it's that blue line that goes across there. Um, for the past two years, what you will see, and it's a little hard to see in this chart, again, because the range of the chart covers uh, a pretty broad range of the assessment, is that the, the remaining schools in the system actually follow. So in year one, the Lighthouse schools are ahead. In year two, the, the, prior, the other schools, the other students catch up. In year three, the White House schools go, go forward again. They advance a little <coughs> bit more. And uh, the non-White House students catch up in the following year. So again, we've seen steady improvements uh, in our White House schools uh, with our White House students um, over time, followed by the system as a whole. The same is true in math. Uh, as in uh, reading, again, for the past two years, um, Students in our White House schools have exceeded the national average for both those two years. And again, if you'll notice that starting on the left-hand side, you'll see that the orange, which represents students in the other schools, um, has risen as well over time. So they follow in lockstep following uh, the White House schools in the, the subsequent years. So moving on uh, to growth and achievement in grades three through five, intentionally overlapping here. Um, again, in grades three through five, we're using MAP and PARC. We use MAP primarily as a measure of growth, but it also informs us in terms of achievement. And again, we're then uh, connecting the dots with PARC as we move forward. If we look at ELA, um, Again, based on MAP, growth exceeded expectations by 16 to 17 percent in grades three through five. And again, it led to improvements uh, on MAP that for the first time exceeded the national average in all three grades. That in turn uh, was reflected in PARC. And you can see that between 2015-16 uh, and 16-17, we saw improvements in PARC across the board. 
Results in mathematics were a little bit different. Um, while growth was adequate on MAP, um, the average um, achievement on MAP declined slightly in third grade, which we saw before. And these overall difference, and uh, again, uh, declined slightly in fifth grade as well. Um, these overall differences in the mean score for MAP are actually then exaggerated when you get to the cut score for career and college readiness on PARC. Results in these grades were also mixed at the state level. Now we're going to look at this data a little bit differently, and the state has started to do this, and, and this is in line with how the state's going to look at accountability for uh, our buildings. They're going to do grade banding. So if we look at uh, grade banding for grades three through five in elementary school, uh, this is how they're going to aggregate the data for that purpose. And what you'll see that um, in this case, again, the lighthouse schools in grades three through five, the dark blue bar to the right, exceed the performance of the state as a whole. Whereas, again, the, the students in the other schools at this point are lagging behind. But again, historically what we have seen is that, that ha they have caught up as we've moved along. Mathematics shows a similar pattern. The pattern uh, continues with mathematics with, again, uh, students in our White House schools outperforming in the state as a whole and our non-White House schools, as we would expect, would be following behind. Moving onward through uh, grades six through eight, again, we use MAP and PARC for our measures in this case. And this gets a little bit more complicated, and uh, particularly when we get to mathematics. In terms of ELA, um, Growth rates in reading exceeded the national average, uh, but they were much more modest in comparison to the lower grades. Uh, while the achievement on the map increased or slightly remained stable, um, we didn't see the gains that we saw in the lower grades, and that sort of makes sense in terms of where we are with our implementation of some of the, the things that we've done. Um, so the, the scores that we saw on map are largely consistent with what we see on, on park, where scores went up or remained stable in this, in this grade band. Mathematics to say the least are mixed. Um, if we look at math here, um, again, the growth rates here, where we've seen uh, growth rates that were 10, 15, 20% above average, here the growth rates are, are really comparable to the national average. So we're not seeing that additional bump uh, in, the, in the middle school grades. And if we look at this, this is a really, this park data is really inconsistent. It, the seventh grade scores are the lowest in the state. And yet the eighth grade scores are in the top 25% uh, of the state. So how do you go from the lowest in the state to the top 25 in the state in one year? That's hard to make sense of. Part of it begins to make sense when we look at algebra. And so I, I put in the algebra slide here, and I've disaggregated it by grade. And what you see is that we have a, uh, some very high performing students who take algebra one in sixth and seventh grade and they outperformed the state as a whole, again, the orange bar in the middle, uh, and significantly outperformed the state as a whole. Our students in grade eight and high school uh, don't perform as well as, as their colleagues around the state. So one could ask, well, what, looking at seventh grade, what proportion of our students take algebra one? Well, about a third of the students who take algebra one at the state level, across the state, are in BCPS we have a disproportionately large representation of students who take Algebra one in seventh grade. So, I'm not, while I'm not trying to say, you know, math is, is rosy, I, I really have a hard time trying to give the community a consistent picture with PARC because it's not a full cohort. It's not an apples to apples comparison. Fortunately, we have MAP in this case, and MAP gives us an apples to apples comparison. We've got a full cohort. We have our entire sixth grade takes MAP. We have our entire seventh grade take MAP. We have our entire eighth grade take MAP. It is a full cohort comparison. And what we see is that you know, mathematics is a challenge. Our, our scores in mathematics are flat or slightly declining across grades six, seven, and eight. And I think this is the most honest representation of our mathematics performance at the middle school level. Uh, I cannot make sense of, you know, lowest in seventh grade, top quarter in eighth grade. That, that isn't a, a reflection of the whole cohort. That's reflections of, of subsets of students as they move forward. Moving into high school, 
we have a list of things that we look at. We, again, we look at PARC, we look at PSAT, we look at the SAT, we're going to look at CTE, and we're going to look at uh, college readiness um, and persistent in, persistence indicators as we move forward. In terms of PARC, um, the one consistent cohort measure that we have for PARC in high school is ELA 10. And I'm pleased to say that our students showed a 4.1 percentage point increase in ELA 10. And those gains on, on PARC were observed across all subgroups. And that's really uh, very good news for our, our, our students. When we look at SAT data, uh, data, and I know that there was a release on SAT today, and I want to sort of clarify, this is SAT day data. This is our 11th graders. The data that was reported today had to do with college-going seniors, different numbers, <laughs> and, and aligned to different thresholds. When we look at our SAT day uh, data, we see that our scores have gone up both in evidence-based reading and writing and mathematics. And this is an apples to apples. It's on the same scale. Uh, because it was given in the spring of both years. Um, access continues to increase. We have more kids taking it, and we see, uh, again, uh, performance increasing across the board for all subgroups. Um, I know at least one person here will probably uh, be curious about ACT data, and our ACT data has also been increasing. Uh, we have between seven and 800 students a year taking the ACT, and we have about 63% of those students who are meeting the career and college readiness threshold on the ACT. The benchmarks for this, uh, for 11th grade, again, different than high school, or different for um, 12th grade, uh, they are 460 for the evidence-based reading and writing, and our students exceed that. Uh, and 510 for mathematics, again, indicating uh, that we're a little bit below that on mathematics in an area that we need to work. Moving forward, we've talked about graduation data, and again, um, our students have been showing steady improvements in the graduation rate, and those gains have been observed by all subgroups with the exception of our English learners. We've talked about that before, and it's an area that we, we need to continue to focus as we move forward. And last year, for the first time, our African-American white students graduated at, at comparable weights, uh, rates, virtually identical. So now transitioning more to post high school or things that are associated with career and college readiness uh, as, as final indicators. In terms of CTE and career, we have greater access at this point. Uh, our CTE enrollment's up 6% from uh, the prior year. We have over 15,000 students who are engaged in uh, career and technology education courses. Um, and we have improved career readiness. Um, more students are completing their CTE pathways. And in terms of that readiness, that, that it also includes more students meeting industry certification standards, with 79% meeting industry certification standards, and uh, nearly 74% meeting dual certification with, with uh, the college system in, in the state. And maybe the most impressive number to me is that uh, nearly 84% of our CTE completers end up um, in some sort of post-secondary placement, education, employment, or the military within the first half a year uh, following their graduation. Fine way, and I'm almost done and ready to hand this over. Um, we use national clearinghouse data to understand our uh, college-going rates. And one of the things that has been impressive to me is that as our graduation rate has increased, our college going rate has remained stable. Uh, some, my, my question, you know, as grad rate goes up, are, are things getting watered down and, and are folks not going on to college? That's not the case. We see that our graduation, our, pardon me, our college going rate has remained stable. And more impressive to me is that our college persistence rate, those students who go on, who, who were adequately prepared to earn enough credits to go into their second year of college, has actually increased. And that those increases have been observed across um, both community college, four-year college, and across the institution types, both private and public. So putting it all together <laughs> uh, from K up, um, so despite the, the challenges that we see you know, with uh, declining kindergarten readiness and above average poverty rates, we are seeing consistent gains in reading and mathematics in K3 as measured by MAP. Um, we're also seeing positive uh, improvements in grades three through five in ELA, and with students in our White House schools <coughs> exceeding the state average uh, um, on the ELA measures in that grade band. 
we see that we have room for improvement in mathematics and that, that room for improvement is um, really evident from grade five up in mathematics. ELA scores in six through eight and 10 have increased or remained stable. Our SAT access and, and performance rates have, have improved. We see improvements in uh, both access and readiness and placement for our students who uh, select career and technical education pathways. And we see that our college going rates have remained stable and persistence rates have actually increased over time. And with that, I will pass things over to Dr. Boswell McComas to talk about how we're gonna use this data to inform instruction. So good evening. Good evening. So moving forward, what, um, what I will have the opportunity to talk with us tonight about is what are we doing now that we, we analyze our data and you saw the constellation of data that we work through with different grade levels. So what is the deep work that we're doing instructionally? Um, and I'd like to first talk about mathematics. Um, what we recognize when we look at the different measures is that there's really three key aspects of um, difficulty that our students struggle with regarding our mathematics performance and our mathematics growth. One of course is foundational numeracy skills and these are uh, the, the traditional traditional skills that all of us are familiar with, um, understanding whole numbers, fractions, decimals, along with standard um, um, uh, math facts, right? Adding, subtracting, uh, multiplying, and dividing. And, and their ability to be truly fluent in those numeracy skills um, in grades three through six. Second is algebraic expressions and equations. Having our students um, in grades six through algebra one recognize how to identify algebraic um, expressions in a given context to be able to construct those algebraic expressions um, as well as the multiple steps to solving them computationally uh, with accuracy, uh, which of course is very anchored in their numeracy foundation. Uh, so we see students who of course struggle with foundational numeracy also of course then struggle with algebraic expressions and equations. And then lastly, reasoning and application. One of the, the demands, if you think back to the examples that Dr. Brown showed earlier, when we look at the complexity of um, the park mathematics and we look at the complexity of the SAT mathematics, what we require students to do um, is to um, provide uh, the ability to pull out information from a given context, sort out distracting information, recognize which equation or formula they must construct, uh, and then provide the rationale as to why they chose to solve the problem that way. Um, this is an example of the reasoning and application uh, scenario uh, that we know our students struggle with. As we've tried to illustrate, one of the key differences that uh, we expect of our students today compared perhaps to those of us who went to school decades ago, um, that there is a great deal of text complexity and reading requirements layered on top of just the mathematical habits of mind and mathematical reading, uh, reasoning processes. Um, so this is what we know is the, the heart of our struggle. Uh, and so when we go into, now that we understand where we're struggling, what we plan to do about that, um, I'm gonna speak to like three uh, key aspects um, of the work that we're engaging in. First and foremost, we know the most powerful thing that happens in terms of moving uh, student learning uh, is the work that we support teachers in. Uh, last year, our mathematics office um, provided um, introductory professional learning across the district on uh, professional learning communities. And, and they really just introduced that last year. And what we found is that the schools that uh, really work deeply and uh, with that work, we've actually found had promising practices and produced double digit gains um, on their part compared to other schools that were not as habitual with um, engaging in that work. So that we've identified best practices and emerging promising practices within our district uh, that we will study more closely and we will seek to expand those practices 
practices in the school. Uh, second, as part of that collaborative planning process, is really um, getting into classrooms. As all of you are familiar, we um, reorganize school support. And as part of that, we have uh, resource teachers to go and support schools um, it, through instructional coaching. And so those resource teachers support that collaborative planning process. They help coach that. And then they also go into the classroom to help see how the implementation of instruction is delivered uh, based on those collaborative data-driven processes. Moving on to professional learning, um, we know that um, one of the main things that we really need to support our teachers in and support our students in is providing them mathematics application, uh, practice in application um, and context. So for example, we need uh, fewer opportunities to just, I think as Dr. Brown said, plug and chug uh, traditional formulas and giving them more complex scenarios more frequently and helping them learn how to persist and wrestle through those mathematical uh, application situations uh, so that they discern how to sort out critical information from distracting information, what are the processes for constructing those algebraic expressions, and then of course the ability to computationally complete those um, equations. Um, and lastly, in the curriculum offices, we are actively analyzing and, and um, looking at what are the curricular revisions that need to uh, be in place. Um, one of the new aspects that we are looking at in supporting teachers with curriculum is learning progressions, and that is uh, a method by which we can have teachers uh, look at student work and compare where does that fall out uh, in terms of a scale of meeting the standard uh, practice uh, versus um, not quite meeting the standard, and what are those specific skills that, that we need to, to coach and support a student or to move their, their mathematical practice to that next level, the standard. Moving on to ELA. Likewise, what are the items that we know our students struggle the most with um, that really guide our work? First and foremost, and our superintendent has really spoken to this um, as part of our uh, central initiative, our district initiative around literacy. We understand that the increasing demands of these assessments really expand well beyond the ELA classroom itself and that we need to engage students much more actively and consistently in nonfiction text, specifically in um, evidence-based reading and writing, and that's really where we get into helping students develop their skill in identifying and evaluating an argument in a text and across many uh, texts at, a sa at the same time. Analyzing why and how individuals and events develop within and across texts, and lastly, to um, have students be able to speak to how the point of view or purpose of a text shapes that text or those series of documents. Um, as you can see, the literacy demands here really require us to recognize that um, students must engage in a wide array of text complexity um, and that um, those texts cannot just live just within our traditional English block or our English classrooms, that that text engagement must transcend into social studies, science, and technical classrooms uh, so that students have the adept skill to be able to address, um, address college and career readiness standards of performance. So what is our approach to um, support this work? We know, likewise, the power of collaborative planning for our teachers. Uh, the more that we can support our teachers by bringing professionals together and looking at the resources and um, looking at the data and planning collaboratively yields greater results for our students and greater support for our professionals. They learn uh, a great deal from one another when given the opportunity. Uh, one of the key strategies that we are taking in those collaborative planning processes, and we began this last year, and we will continue this work is to um, help our teachers calibrate what exactly um, a, a four looks like, a three looks like. Uh, we call this range finding so that we use public release um, documents and um, for teachers to actually understand what a, a high scoring uh, constructed response looks like so that they can um, have a good sense of calibration for analyzing and assessing student work and providing feedback to student work. 
professional learning, uh, we will go on and um, we are working uh, with schools to analyze their school-based evidence statements. Now what this is, this is essentially a school snapshot of how their students performed on the standards in PARC. And so um, these um, school-based evidence snapshots, if you will, uh, make it very visually clear to uh, school leaders and to teachers exactly what standards their students are doing well on and where their students are falling uh, short on. And it helps the school then uh, collectively focus on what is something, uh, what is a specific standard within their building that they can target and move uh, and focus their work and our student growth on. Going, sorry, going on, um, as we have spoken about earlier, the importance of developing nonfiction text uh, strategies. Uh, as many of us uh, here tonight recognize, reading a novel uh, is a very different skill set than reading a technical uh, piece of writing. And if you're um, reading a wide array of text, some of which may be technical, some of which may be journal accounts, some of which may be um, examples of fiction, and you're analyzing that, um, you have to have a high level of vocabulary. So one of our strategies along with um, techniques for reading nonfiction is to really start to hone on, on that domain specific vocabulary. Every field and every profession um, moves deeper into its own set of vocabulary. Science is a perfect example of really high demand vocabulary uh, that if we don't specifically build that capacity in our students, we leave them at a disadvantage. Um, and then um, at the early grades, certainly a focus on systemic explicit phonics, and phonics instruction in those primary grades. Um, and again, our English office continues to analyze and revise curriculum to ensure that we have the resources to support where our students um, are struggling um, in terms of standards. So well, before, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, before we uh, get to questions, I just wanted to take some time to thank our teachers uh, and our administrators as well. We can see the need for literacy across the disciplines, as uh, Drs. Brown and McComas have stated. And I know that our teachers and administrators have really uh, taken hold of that. Um, that message and they understand the need for literacy across the disciplines and so they're working diligently. I've had the pleasure of visiting several classrooms and I see how hard our teachers are working across the disciplines to make sure that literacy is a focus. I also wanted to say that the purpose of the work session like tonight is to bring issues to the board that are of interest to the board as stated at the board's retreat. So this was one of the areas um, that was one of the top vote-getters, if you will, um, in terms of student achievement. We wanted to make sure that we're giving you a full and robust picture of student performance, not just related to PARC, but including PARC, as well as MAP, our CTE performance, our graduation performance, so that you have a full picture of how our students are performing. That means the good, the bad, and the ugly sometimes, but we wanted to make sure that you have an honest and um, full account of how our students are performing as well as the actions that go along with that performance based on root cause analysis that we've done. So thank you to Drs. Brown and to Dr. McComas, not only for their analysis, but also for their action. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll join in and say I know that I speak for the board when I say thank you for the fine presentation you made, uh, the, both uh, the data side and the what are we going to do next side. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, are there questions or comments that board members have of either uh, Dr. Uh, either of our speakers? Mr. Yulefelder. I, I think, and, and I've read a lot on this, and I'm sure we all have, that the impact of poverty has throughout your presentation. There, there's no doubt in my mind that, that that is a main factor. And if we drill down to the root cause, uh, I think we'll find that, that poverty uh, you know, runs a list. Of, of, you know, and I don't know how we can solve that. Uh, we, we are. We have a greater influx of, of uh, poverty kids in the county than we've ever had before, and uh, the numbers say that it's going to continue to increase. And so, you know, how do we solve, get down to that root problem and solve that problem, or at least in some way address the problem so that within the literacy, mm -hmm. because I think poverty and literacy uh, correlate uh, how, how are we going to do, do all that? I mean, where, where's our answer for that? 
Uh, we don't control the poverty. I understand that. Right. Uh, and while we have no silver bullet, um, I will tell you that one of the most significant and powerful things that we can do as teachers is to first truly understand where each and every student is. And that's why the importance of really um, having um, baseline data, um, diagnostic data, to really understand where each student is so that, that we can craft those learning experiences. Um, I think many of us um, experienced over the last, you know, 50, 60 years, our, our models of instruction really were largely one size fits all. So what we recognize is the more that we can tailor learning to a student, recognizing where they start, it gives us a much greater opportunity to move them forward um, no matter where they start. So as a student who comes in who may be coming from an impoverished background, where their starting line is is very different than a student who comes who's not impoverished. Um, and what we need to recognize is that what we do for each of them needs to be different. And again, Mr. Yofro, there's no silver bullet, but that is truly one of the most powerful strategies we can do. I, I kind of, in my own mind, think about it as the difference between um, group exercise and working with a personal trainer. If I go to a gym and I or when I was in the Army and we did exercises, we all did the same exercise at the same rhythm. I got something out of that, but when you work with a personal trainer and they tell you lift your elbow and do this, it's a whole lot harder and I got a whole lot better, a whole lot faster. So um, sorry to make such a off, uh, uneducational comparison, but for me this is how I think how much more powerful that approach is for our, our students. Do you think that, that your presentation and, and maybe uh, it gets adjusted is one that should be presented at PTA meetings and back to school night so parents understand not only what you're recognizing but maybe what they have to do mm -hmm. I, I certainly think it's always helpful to engage our, our families in understanding where, uh, where their student is and where our students are. And certainly, the more we work in partnership, the better our students will thrive. Thank you. And there's so many moving parts, um, not to complicate things, but school-based nutrition, I'm sure, has a, a, a major play in, mm -hmm. in the process as well. Ms. Schaefer has a question. Um, so I was wondering if any programs that would be established to increase SAT scores or park scores would be elastic and up to the schools or like county mandated, I guess. Um, at Pikesville, we've started to do this thing called Project 520, which is where um, every morning in your English or math class, you would take a practice SAT in either English or math every day for ever, I guess. Um, <laughs> for seniors, at least it's the first two quarters to try to get our average score up to a 1040 and we also do sit for lit which is um i think twice a month we read for 20 minutes in various mm -hmm. classes so it's not always our english class we're reading like i read in my multimedia class which was kind of weird to do in front of a computer but it was really interesting and um i was just wondering if that would be a mandated thing that bcps would give to the schools or if they would give the opportunity to give to the schools to do what they want to do because not every school has the same test score. Mm -hmm. So, um, Go ahead. our school progress planning process each year actually provides schools um, quite a lot of autonomy. Schools have the opportunity to, to do a root cause analysis. We've done one systemically here, and, and uh, Dr. Boswell McComas has gone through and talked about our systemic response in terms of curriculum. The buildings have the opportunity to do the same process, and obviously, the needs at Pikesville are, are likely very different than the needs at, say, Lansdowne. And so what happens is when folks are, who are very close to the students do a root cause analysis, then they tailor responses that they think are going to help their students move forward and then implement them. Uh, while we expect to see changes in SAT, while we expect to see um, changes in park scores and graduation rate, et cetera, we do not drill that down uh, with a by student target uh, in terms of expectations, or no, nor are we that prescriptive in terms of you will do this as a school. Mr. McDaniels. Thank, thank you. Um, I certainly wanted to echo the comments about thanking you for the presentation and helping us understand where our students are. I really think this is what we are really about as a system, so thank you again. Um, 
I wanted to ask, um, during the information you presented, you mentioned that the um, graduation rate for black students is very close to uh, the white students. And I think over the recent months and, and years, we've seen information that comes to the board that helps us understand how we got there. There are additional resources to keep track of where kids are so they don't fall behind and, and um, bridge programs to help them keep. So we kind of can see how that's connected. Um, but when we look at uh, some of the ELA data and some of the math data, there's some really still big gaps between our black and brown students. and. Can you tell us what the system is trying to do? You know, we can see the, the, the correlation with graduation, but what are we trying to do in some of these other areas where there still remain huge gaps and um, between our populations to begin to move everybody up? So I'll, I'll start with data. <laughs> okay. So um, I know that over time we've talked about how we use data to help inform the grad rate. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, Mr. McDaniels, we know when students are off track, we know why they're off track, and we adapt and respond to that. When we develop those trajectories towards career and college readiness, we wanted to be able to backward map uh, readiness over time so that we had data to know where students were with respect to that trajectory. Are they on that path to become career and college ready? So that we could intervene earlier with students. Because, you know, quite frankly, if you wait until high school to, to try to close that gap for the SAT, that's, that's pretty challenging. And so that same structure that we've used for graduation is in place and is beginning to inform our work towards closing the gaps in terms of student achievement as well. Okay. All right, and one other just uh, comment uh, to, follow up Dr. McComas's comment about having understanding. Some of the charts that we're presented with um, where it's stated we're exceeding the state levels or um, improving from year to year, the, the, the chart just showed you know, a very small difference. And, I mean, and then other charts that showed a bigger difference, the comment was, well, there's a slight decline here. And it's very difficult for for me, I just say as a board member to really understand the whole story with without either some percentage or some more information. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, yeah. So you all got some books today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they, they have a lot of information in it. Um, I will say that the, um, again, the charts, the way they were presented, I did my best to keep the axes uh, stable. Okay. Um, to make a fair comparison over time. Um, that can make it really hard to see the differences. It's much easier if I just sort of blow them up <laughs> right. uh, and reduce the scale so that, that you're just looking at a narrow window of it. Um, it where we have invested the most time with uh, our personalized learning, we have seen gains, again, that equate to two to three okay. months of instruction. Uh, those are reflected on MAP over time versus our baseline before we introduced that. To, to where we are today. Uh, two to three months of instruction is a significant amount of time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Young. In your um, presentation, you mentioned the increased poverty rate. You mentioned um, the decline in kindergarten readiness. Associated with those, well, maybe not associated, but is there or do you see that part of the problem are, you know, maybe transient students that are not there long enough to get the services and that they need? It's always an issue. I, don't, I was guess I can speak instructionally, but if you yeah. <laughs> I'll, yeah, take a swing at take, it. Yeah, because so I, I don't have the data. Right, and, and forgive me, Mr. Emory, um, Mr. Young, I don't have those the transient numbers in front of me, but I will certainly speak to um, firsthand experience uh, as a teacher and principal. Certainly, you know, the, the less stable an environment a child lives in, the more and more challenging it is for that child to be successful academically. And so transiency certainly is uh, dramatically impactful for students and obviously would also be impactful in terms of our data analysis. But I think this again speaks to the importance of um, our climate work in our district. You know, our superintendent has been cleared 
clear about literacy and climate, right? Because what we need to do is reach out and embrace each child, understand their story. We need to know uh, what that child is facing so that we can deliver just-in-time supports, both academically, socially, emotionally, um, and, and fully leverage all of our multi-tiered systems of support for a child. Um, so I think as a person who has worked firsthand with students in that uh, and, and worked with students who are not in that case, I can tell you that's really where uh, we as a system have to pull the, pull the full orchestration of all our resources together. And in terms of the data, it, it is worth mentioning, um, Mr. Yang, you do bring up a very good point. Um, some states impose rules on which students can count and which don't in an accountability model. The data that we presented today is raw data. It's the students who took the test. And it, it's not taking any students out based on how long they were with us. It's not applying any rules that exclude students. You're seeing a full picture of the students who were enrolled at the time of the test. That's, that's true of the data that you have in front of you in the book um, tied to MAP. It's true for the, the park data as well. Um, I think that's the most transparent way, at least initially, to present the data, uh, though your question is, is a good one, uh, because we do know that the transiency um, is often associated with lower uh, performance on, on assessments. Um, and it's also part of why it's so important for us, I think, to, to look at student growth, um, because irrespective of where a student comes to us, we can ensure that they're getting at least a year's worth of instruction while they're with us. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to join my colleagues first in thanking you both for the work that was involved in this presentation. The level of detail and explanation has been incredibly helpful. So thank you very much, and please extend my appreciation to your staffs as well. Um, my comment is a follow-up to Mr. McDaniel's comment um, regarding talking about the incremental change. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. It would be helpful to have common terminology, regardless of the direction of the performance change, to understand the significance of that change. When I hear you discuss an improvement in performance, it's described as this is significant, it's a two to three, the equivalent of two to three months of instruction. When the direction is the opposite, it's described as being flat or a slight decrease. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think the raw data would suggest otherwise. It would be helpful to have common terminology to help the board understand what is the significance of the data that we're reviewing. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. if you'd like to comment on that. Um. I, I think it's a, it's a reasonable comment. Um, I know that I've spent more time in, in terms of the analysis of grades K through three, and so I'm able to contextualize it in terms of, of um, months of instruction. Uh, with the newer measures, particularly PARC, I'm not quite there yet to be able to do that crosswalk. Um, and so it, it does limit my ability uh, to say that. I do know, you know, when I'm talking about the MAP measures, um, so for example, if you look at grade six, seven, and eight math, um, those scores are relatively flat. On the other hand, the, the, the scores on Parker are all over the map. Uh, and I think they're very hard to understand because they're not cohorts of kids. You know, part of the cohort's taken out in each case. And so um, it makes it harder to make a common inference in that case. But I will continue to work towards um, trying to communicate the results in a way that I think um, is, is clearly understandable to a layperson. I, I'm not a fan, um, and now I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox. People, people want to talk about statistical significance all the, all the time. Um, when we're dealing with population numbers, when we have all the scores, the differences are what the differences are at that point. Inferential statistics don't tell you anything. You know, inferential statistics is to take a, a sample and make an inference about a population. If I have the population numbers, I know what the differences are at that point. Mrs. So Mr. it then it becomes an issue of quantifying those differences in terms of um, what does it really mean? Is it a meaningful magnitude? And I would suggest again what we've seen in K three of two to three months of instruction, that is a practically meaningful difference in instructional outcome. Right. And we trust your ability to make the to do that analysis and to interpret that data for the board. What I would like to see is more 
more of that, the, your analysis and what those differences mean um, to better understand it. Because looking at the raw data, I think, doesn't tell the whole picture. And maybe we're not comparing apples to apples. So your analysis is of incredible value. Well, I appreciate that. And, I, and I've taken your, your note to heart. And I will continue to work to, again, translate things into practical significance. Mrs. I think that's Miller. really what me is meaningful now. Mrs. Miller. Thank you for bringing the graphic representations of data to the board, and, and I look forward to snuggling up to this. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. <laughs> to uh, review the actual numerical data. If you needed um, something to help put you to sleep. <laughs> I did want to say um, I think there's some great things going on with CTE. Um, yeah. it, that looks great, and, and just visiting uh, schools and, and hearing about those programs mm -hmm. have been great. Um, I also wanted to uh, mirror what a couple of our stakeholders said earlier today. Um, when the system makes investments toward student achievement, we expect returns to match or exceed those investments. Mm -hmm. So if we're making a small investment, we expect at least a small return. Mm -hmm. When we're making a quarter billion dollar investment, like mm -hmm. with STAT, we expect miracles. Mm -hmm. And if we're not getting miracles, it's indicative of a problem, potentially. Um, the data shows gains in student achievement that are relatively insignificant to non-existent. In some areas, there's a decrease in achievement. Uh, we know, for example, that there's been a drop in park scores. And the JHU evaluation also described any changes as being significantly insignificant. Not only are we seeing, we're not seeing miracles in student achievement commensurate with the financial cost of STAT, but our system, students, parents, and teachers are being detrimented by the overwhelming opportunity cost of STAD, which affects every department in the system. Uh, so I guess the next logical follow-up to this presentation then is to, to find out, given these numbers and what we've seen so far, how is our interim superintendent and the system um, going to distinguish itself from the, our predecessor, <laughs> or how are we going to stay the course? And, and the board really needs to get some really uh, detailed response to that. I, I don't mean tonight, but hopefully in the near future so we have some idea where we're going with regard to STAT and, uh, and how it's impacting the rest of our system. I'd like to respond to that. So again, um, thank you for your comments and for your question as well. In terms of personalizing instruction, I think that we need to stay the course in terms of personalizing instruction for our students and making sure that we meet their needs with, through multi-tiered systems of support. Not only uh, those academic supports, but the wraparound supports as well. We need to make sure that we're equipping our teachers with the tools and resources that they need, as well as our students with the tools and resources that they need as well, so that they can um, perform and they can make sure that they have a customized program just for them. So in terms in terms of um, that literacy piece, we need to make sure that that literacy is not only across the disciplines, but that we have uh, the tools available so that students can interact with instruction appropriately. So I think I've been pretty clear about that direction. I think um, I've been clear with our teachers. We see it happening in our classrooms. And our data is suggesting that our Lighthouse schools are outperforming other schools in the state as well as schools in the district. So unless we have a trajectory that tells us otherwise, uh, that is the course of action. Anyone else have any comments or questions before we move on to uh, committee updates? <coughs> Stuart and then Mrs. Causey. I suspect mine might be more brief than Mrs. Causey's, but um, I, I will say just on the issue of kindergarten and kindergarten readiness uh, that um, I wonder what kind of analysis is being done as it relates to pre-K opportunities, as it relates to Head Start opportunities, and as we, you know, as I walk through 
um, certain schools, some of those programs are not being taken advantage of to the same degree that they could be. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I kind of wonder what impact and what kind of efforts we need to make as it relates to targeting that population early so that we don't have to rely upon really catching up in such a significant way in the first few grades of education. <laughs> I, I would I would certainly uh, say you know um, first of course uh, I mean uh, things that are not universally funded we have patchwork experiences for students and so we recognize students prior to kindergarten um, have they enter kindergarten with you know a wide array of experiences based on what their families were able to access uh, rather that's because of their awareness of the programs or their ability to actually transport to and from um, um, programs prior to kindergarten these are uh, if you start to really unravel those what what happens before kindergarten for children? Um, the stories and, and challenges and resources and supports are as diverse as our students. Um, and so I would just, again, as an educator who's worked firsthand with um, students, um, you know, the more we can provide resources and opportunities and, and communicate that access to parents, the, the better off our students are when they enter kindergarten. Um, but as you're well aware, uh, the resources for uh, students in that age group vary significantly and the funding sources vary significantly. Right, I guess at least one comment here would be my hope is that as we continue to leverage the community school approach, that's kind of one of those services that I we see. can continue mm -hmm. to target with our families. I see, thank you. This is cozy. Uh, <clears throat> the one thing I, I actually would like to add to that though uh, as well, um, being someone who entered uh, education in reading first, uh, I have a, a great deal of value obviously for early childhood education and I'm pleased um, that as we're adding um, new schools, as we're building new elementary schools, we're actually creating the space for pre-K seats. Uh, you know, as a system, when we're 4,000 seats underwater, we have 4,000 seats uh, less than we have students in, in the elementary environment, as we're closing that gap and, and creating the space to actually accommodate pre-K, I think we're structurally preparing to meet that need over time as well. Mrs. Cosey. Thank you. I also want to thank uh, the superintendent and staff for uh, providing this update to us. Um, again, um, this has been more information that we've received um, than in the previous administration. Um, I would just like you to briefly outline um, the BCPS, the current graduation requirements related to MSA and PARC, and then please um, outline the current position of the state board and MSDE related to PARC and graduation, specifically waivers. So that's something that, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'll have to work with the superintendent to get back with you on because it's a moving target <laughs> and it's complicated. Uh, it varies based on cohort and what, what year someone entered. Uh, the, the, that is not a simple answer. Uh, so yes, there's an entire, I think, uh, okay. chart on that, a graphic that we can certainly provide to the board. Yes, uh, I'm familiar it with a, it. The, the point is that when we are, uh, as a board and as a community and the stakeholders, evaluating the progress of our students, that it's important to understand that the MAP scores do not work towards graduation requirements. And the MAP scores do not work towards the college and career ready requirements that we have from the state legislature. The park test, correct, is the one that we, the, that the board will be held accountable for our students to meet graduation requirements. So to me that's like um, the difference between the English system and the metric system. One can linearly translate the scores between the two. Uh, parks only given once a year. Um, I think we need more data to inform instruction and map triangulates with that and gives us a very similar picture. And it's the cut point that we use that, that aligns. Right, and I agree with you that we need more information because when you're presenting the information to us about math and saying it's mixed, when actually there's declines, we need to understand that. And when I, thank Actually, you, I th think I was pretty I, clear in saying that the math scores declined in grades six through eight. Yes, and, and, and the thing to understand about, thank you for providing this, um, I, what I would like is after we review this, the time to submit additional questions related to 
the information that we just received today around uh, our students' performance. Because what's important to understand is that we need to work to get our students uh, ready to graduate with the new requirements coming from PARC. Um, and, and that I would uh, also say that I'm curious why the performance measures that were adopted by the board in July 2015 under Blueprint 2.0 um, were not also included in this as you talk about having a constellation of scores. Uh, for instance, the, three per, uh, the percentage of grade three students demonstrating on grade level reading um, was not included in this. It might be in the, in the larger information we received, but we are currently on a downward trend from fiscal year 14, it was 57.2%. Fiscal year 15, it was 52.3%. Fiscal year 16, it was 50.2%. So I am so grateful for the superintendent's focus on literacy, but just having her say that we're focused on it does not account for, as was mentioned earlier, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we are spending on creating a uh, blended learning digital instructional environment um, we really have to understand where all of those support opportunity costs are. Our uh, class size is increasing. Um, we have a lot of needs that are uh, not being met, and we really need to understand that. The other um, fact, performance measure that was not included is the percentage of students completing algebra with a grade B or higher by end of eighth grade. And I think that is a, a number that was put in by the board because that will include all of the sixth graders, our brilliant sixth graders and our seventh graders and our eighth graders, and to understand what is their achievement level. level. Um, the other question I had is when we talk about supports and having these instructional tools available for our teachers, we've heard tonight from TABCO about teachers having concerns about the technology in that it's not av as available, um, it's not as flexible as they need. So specifically, I'd like to ask for the tech support issues, um, what is the support in the schools for systems that are not working, whether it's laptops for repairs for students or teachers? Is that this been the same over the last four years or is it decreasing or increasing? So if I may, I just wanted to make sure that we're keeping the report clean and that this is not a stat report uh, solely. It is a report on results in terms of student performance. And certainly our um, uh, Hopkins evaluator um, it provided some guidance and recommendations and findings on what we needed to do to improve. And we can certainly get back to the board with um, how we're looking at the device itself. But one of the things that I just want us to um, keep in mind in terms of student performance, we have to make sure that we're looking at our whole picture. When we're looking at MAP, there are various assessments, and certainly we could be here uh, through, for days if we talk about the, the various um, data points that we collect over time, including those that are included in the reporting results that we give annually to the board. Um, we're not, this is an effort to be more transparent uh, in our efforts to make sure that we have um, included all of the significant data points. The park results were re recently released. We did not want to wait to give this report. We wanted to give the report immediately so that as a board you would be informed and the public would also be informed on what those park results said, um, said to us and how we've analyzed the data and the action that we would take as a result result of the um, park performance. So you have the park performance, but that is not the only performance measure. Certainly we had other data points that we thought to bring to you. We will absolutely supply the other um, performance measures that are there. In terms of um, the tools, again, and uh, I think I heard the term miracles, I would only say this, that it is a miracle to a child who is uh, reading about a quarter behind uh, in terms of grade performance, and once they make up that marked uh, kind of improvement, I would uh, suggest that we put ourselves in the shoes of a student who may be underperforming, and what that performance might look like uh, if you make up that performance a quarter uh, of, of instruction when you make up that performance and then you are reading on grade level, that might feel like a miracle. Uh, any more questions before we, we wrap up? Mr. DeVerge. Thank you very much. I'm not finished. All right, we'll get back to you in one second. Mr. DeVerge. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Brown, 
Um, thank you, and I'll join the other board members and thank you for coming and the information that both of you have shared with us this evening with regard um, to the report before us. Um, back when we were doing our review of the operating budget, um, you and I had an occasion to exchange comments during uh, the uh, board meeting reviewing the, the operating budget, and I referenced uh, MAP and uh, you expressed your, um, I want to say, uh, view, I suspect hopeful, optimistic view, that um, the MAP uh, numbers would uh, reflect some positive uh, movement and progress for our students. And uh, as part of that exchange, I said to you, well, I suspect we're going to be having this conversation or words to that effect when the next budget comes before us. Uh, I do appreciate the fact that you've come uh, before the next budget to update the board. Um, what I wanted to ask you is whether when you return that you take a moment and reflect as to what, if anything, differently our system might do beyond what we are currently doing given these results. I don't speak for the full board, I'm just one of 12 members and as has been uh, printed in the paper, we are lay members of the board, although one of our members uh, you know, had a teaching career. Um, I would just ask you to give some thought to that, uh, what uh, in addition to what we currently do, we can uh, add to, as I sometimes say, the quiver of what we have to work with in educating our students. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Dr. Brown. Mrs. Causey, you have the last word. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to point out that when we're uh, in the charts comparing elementary lighthouse schools to the non-lighthouse schools, that the lighthouse schools, um, they're 10 schools and they have disparate results. So that average is not clearly indicating the uh, achievement of the students in the county as, as a consistent average. There are some very high performing schools and there are some schools that are struggling. So I would like to see uh, sent to the board those 10 lighthouse schools, their actual, that where you come to that average because it's not, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very different picture and we really need to understand how is all of our investment, hundreds of millions of dollars over the last several years, helping each of our students because if it's just helping school, high performing schools that were already high performing, that's not really helping the students that we really need to support uh, that are in schools that have been struggling. So if, the I, other, if I could, just, I'd, I'd like to make three points. Okay, uh, you can when I'm done because then Mr. Chair is gonna cut me off, so thank you. Um, and in general, when the slides say better than the state, that's better than the state average. Mm -hmm. So um, when in, our, in terms of our goal of globally competitive and world class, we have much more improvement needed to rise above being average in the state of Maryland. And also in the, a lot of the results, we don't know where we are in, the, in comparing to the state average because the MAP national growth doesn't, it includes all other kinds of school districts that don't have the investment that our state makes in education. All right, now, Dr. Brown, you have the last word. <laughs> so now I've got four points and then I'll be done. Um, one, um, of course, in any group of schools or group of students, there's a distribution of scores and we average them. And so when we looked at uh, lighthouse schools versus non-lighthouse schools versus the state, we're looking at all the students in those schools and of course there's variation in that and one would expect that. Um, two, um, In terms of um, you know, whether or not we need to do additional work, of course we need to, to do additional work. This is a new opportunity threshold. I mean, what we're talking about in terms of trying to prepare kids to be career and college ready is a tremendous uh, change in expectations. Um, the statewide averages are, are well below 50% uh, both in ELA and math on this. It, this is a huge change for us. Um, in terms of MAP, um, I, I'm glad that we use MAP. Um, 
again, it's a bit of a Rosetta Stone. It allows us to compare, and it allows us to compare to actually a larger pool of students than Park does now. You know, with the ever shrinking pool of star, uh, Park states, this is the one measure that allows us to compare ourselves uh, to a broader representation of the United States as a whole. And then finally, because I lost the fourth, <laughs> there was a reason I was trying to stop you. you know, the, the, the audio loop will only keep so much. Um, in terms of Maryland's performance academically, we have the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the, the nation's report card, which is a wonderful uh, assessment that's been in place for quite a long time. Um, Maryland's scores are dead smack in line with the, the nation as a whole. There's no substantial difference between our, our performance in reading and mathematics compared to other states. So I think comparing ourselves to, to national average is, is pretty reasonable. Very good. Well, we thank you again, uh, Dr. Boswell McComas and Dr. Brown for your presentation. Um, how about if some, we have some very brief, uh, very brief committee updates. Mr. Yulfelder, Audit Committee. Uh, the Audit Committee met uh, last week. Uh, we reviewed the progress that the uh, Audit Department makes <coughs> in various undertakings, and uh, it seems that they're chugging along in a very, very fine manner. Very good. Mr. Stewart, anything from uh, buildings? No. Nothing. Mr. McDaniels, anything from curriculum? We met on the 14th of September. We got we, the system's response to the JHU stat report, and comments were also included in the Friday update. Um, we'll meet again on October 19th. Mrs. Miller, anything from digital safety and technology? Yes, we met last week. Um, the SIT committee has a new chair, Mary Bo uh, Boswell McComas. Um, we also have moved to a quarterly schedule instead of the previous bi-monthly, but we did discuss having a more timely response to questions and issues between meetings to kind of help compensate for that change. Uh, also, there is a, the new pri parental privacy opt-out form was distributed to parents in the uh, paper packets at the beginning of the school year. Uh, but it is also available on BCPS1. A lot of parents didn't seem to be aware of that. And the version that's on BCPS1 has pop-ups that explain some of the fields that could be very helpful. Um, the uh, options have been greatly expanded. And um, so parents can make changes to those selections until October 1st for the year. Um, we also discussed over many months the need to provide guidance and oversight on the posting of student images and personal info on social media sites um, by staff members. Um, BCPS is working on getting some professional development in place on this issue, and I ask that the public please alert me of any postings they come across to aid us in this work. And finally, um, BCPS is working on several initiatives this year, including a response plan in the event of a student data breach. And I applaud this very proactive initiative. Mr. Virch, anything on policy review? Mr. Chair, I applaud you for recognizing me with regard to Policy Review Committee. The Policy Review Committee, which saw the uh, departure of its prior chair in spring and our vice chair subsequent to that, and which had not met uh, since uh, May 24th, uh, did in fact meet on uh, September 18th. Um, policies, uh, hard copies of policies, which previously were not made available, uh, although in accordance with the Open Meetings Act, uh, were now made available to anyone who uh, appeared at the committee meeting. Uh, efforts are underway to attempt to have uh, proposed policies posted on the website. And uh, Mr. Dickerson, Dickerson ex expressed uh, uh, or shared comments with board members about that topic. Uh, the board members had a very lively and uh, uh, productive, I feel, uh, conversation about uh, the policies that were reviewed, although we were with out our student member for very, very had, good reasons. I had senior portraits that day, <laughs> right. and they were running very late. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so I would note that uh, the Policy Review Committee will meet again uh, on Wednesday, October um, 16th at 4.30, and uh, among... Wednesday, it's not Wednesday, it's a Monday. Oh, according to David, a Monday, <laughs> a when, uh, October 16th. Yeah, the calendar's in front and, of you. And, and, um, <laughs> uh, here, let me get that calendar report. And uh, among the topics, that will be reviewed um, is a policy about how the board does 
its policies. And, and ancillary to that is also superintendent's rules and how they uh, are then uh, made available and what, if anything, would occur after that. So anyone who'd like to come, uh, who has policy on the mind, please come to the Monday, October 16th Policy Review Committee meeting. Very good. Before, um, before we adjourn, I know um, our superintendent has a comment, but I just want to remind everyone that our next meeting is October 10, and besides public comment on the calendar, we also have public comment on school climate, school behavior, and discipline. Now, Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. In light of recent news, I just would like to ensure, assure the public that I am committed to transparency. So just as the student performance I report tonight, it also extends to our business practices. And I'd like to reassure our stakeholders that we are spending our public funds in a responsible manner. So to that end, I've requested a review of BCPS purchasing practices. Our school system has undergone a legislative performance audit in 2008 and also in 2015. We also have an annual audit of financial statements, which in all of these audits include our Office of Purchasing. Um, further, our, our Office of Purchasing has recently been uh, awarded and recognized for its work on, uh, on September 15th, 2017. The Office of Purchasing received the Achievement of Excellence, Excellence in Procurement Award for the 13th consecutive year. This distinction is, is collectively awarded by the National Procurement Institute, the Institute for Supply Management, and the National Association of Educational Pro Procurement. And BCPS is one of only seven agencies in Maryland and 27 school systems in the nation to receive the award. So therefore, we have every reason to believe that, our, that everything is in order. Nonetheless, I want to be able to provide assurances to the public of our responsible stewardship. Uh, so the scope of the review will be discussed with the board when the recommendations are brought to me um, for approval. So I just wanted to make that announcement. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. Mr. Hayden. <laughs> you can't adjourn without looking around the table, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> On the topic we were just talking about, I'd like to make a motion that the board take a position in supporting the superintendent in conducting an independent review of purchasing practices and contracts and make it official with the board behind it. Great. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. All right, I'm looking around. We're adjourned. <laughs>